discussion? Pelta. Um, there's not a bill. Still. But Senator Ash um, is, is the pro tem of the Senate, which means he's in charge. As why does it why does it never feel like that? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Huh. When you come here you Who feel like you're in charge, don't you? No. No. Probably because some of us reject the idea totally that you're in charge. Like, <laughs> even though you were elected, it's a, it's a very anarchist sort of approach. Yes, Senator, you a completely uh, you know lateral structure. We had a number of uh, groups who yeah. we contacted, and they gave us names of people that might be willing to speak. But we had a number of groups who said, "No, we really don't want to discuss this." So, um, or we're not ready to, or not available. Or not available. Not available. Yeah. It's yeah. Very interesting it to preface. Me, they didn't want to discuss what? the issue. Um, that so table the setting. issue is the title rise and decline of hate groups in Vermont and the United States, and you are the. Well, I um, didn't uh, <clears throat> create that title. Um, but first off, like well, first off, I just want to point out, and Joe's got a copy of the book. Um, Devil in the Grove, uh, which Peter had actually recommended to me a while back, because um, he had read it and I read it. It's a, it's a really fantastic um, bit of history uh, about. Hold on, just a minute. We have the press trying to make an end here, and all they're going to get is my bald head if we don't move the uh, waste basket and uh, recycle them. Um, Got the stamp of science. Did you roll this? No. No, the last time I saw him, he insulted the tie I was wearing. And the only thing that gave me some comfort was that it was actually a tie that Senator Mazza had given me. And then I told Senator Mazza. And so I. That's a Bennington County. So be careful. You're a Bennington County guy? Oh, that explains a lot. Be careful is a good way of putting it. Well, you know. It could be dangerous. We could stick, up, stick up for ourselves, right? Absolutely. All right. He brought me a coffee. Anyway, back to the So, um, so the, um, so, um, after, this book is about um, four young men who were um, pretty clearly wrongly uh, accused of um, a sexual assault back in the 50s in a part of basically an orange country in Florida, which really has been, people don't really associate Florida with being part of some of the worst uh, racial um, animosity in this country. Um, they think of the other states in the South, but parts of Florida were, by all accounts, some of the worst places in America and most isolated. This is before the tourist boom and the space industry and all that kind of took off down there. And I, after having read the book maybe a year or so ago, um, just about a month and a half or two months ago, the new governor of Florida pardoned the four men who had been what many believe is very wrongly convicted in what was a real sham. And uh, so I had reached out to him and said, you know, is there any chance you could come up to Vermont and just talk about this experience? And it wasn't just because he wrote a great book, but really about this issue of um, trying to bring, not closure, but trying to revisit some of the wrongs that have been conducted in the past and think about how a society processes through that and gets to the other side to the extent it can. And so uh, he'll be coming up here and speaking in the Senate chamber um, in a couple weeks, and also UVM uh, has uh, provided some money to have them do a nighttime talk in Burlington. So I think it's just really, uh, I think really exciting. Um, the issue uh, you guys are looking at today is one that um, I think is, it makes sense that some people wouldn't know quite what to say or do about it, in part because in communities all throughout the state, uh, including Burlington, I know in Brattleboro and Bennington and other communities, from time to time, it might be something as um, not simple, but as um, low tech as someone putting a flyer somewhere in public. Uh, Free Press yesterday had an image uh, in the paper of one of their news boxes with the paper on one side, with the you know that day's front page sort of prominent on the front, and on the side was something that said "Better uh, Dead Than Red," and it was a play on the old. Theme, uh, but obviously meant to signal some uh, anger about uh, some people's political persuasions. Um, racial, racially based or anti-Semitic based uh, graffiti, flyers, spray paint have been popping up on college campuses, 
uh, in public libraries, on sidewalks, at schools, you name it. And it's not coming from nowhere. Somewhere there are individuals who wake up on a given day and think I'm going to go do this small act that has an influence, has an impact, which is obviously much greater. And so, uh, you know, I think we all have to be mindful of how to nip some of these attitudes in the bud at the earliest stage. Education is always the best, single best way, and I think um, some of the people you have speaking will um, shed some light about, uh, in terms of how we can do a better job making sure that um, we do whatever we can to prevent this kind of thinking from lodging in people's minds uh, throughout the state. And I, um, I'll just conclude by saying one of the things I think we all know to be true is one small racially motivated act has a massive effect on the community in terms of the message it sends, the feeling of uh, not feeling included, uh, feeling of potentially physical harm or risk. And so uh, we'll never solve you know, bias and bigotry altogether as much as we try, but we certainly have a long way to go to make sure we can kind of prevent this sort of stuff. I really appreciate you leadership on this, and I want to mention two things. One, one every, everyone I think is pretty aware of the Bennington situation, and um, former Representative Morris, but also other uh, white power things that have been written, uh, swastikas and so forth in Bennington. And you know, it's hard for me as a public official to say strongly enough for some people that I deplore this action, that I'm, you know, horrified by it, I, I don't, you know, I think it's outlandish. So, I, you know, through this testimony today, I could understand better some of, you know, are we responding, we as public officials, are we responding in an appropriate manner? Uh, I was meeting with some probation officers last night, and one of them related a story that was so familiar to me. Back and a few years ago, we used to send offenders to New Jersey and Virginia. And a kid that I had worked with came back, and I saw him, and he was full of swastikas and little <coughs> white power type, you know, things. I, Lonnie, what in the heck? You know, I was, you know, just saying, you, know, you idiot. And he responded that, you know, I was 19 years old. I was down there in a prison, and I had to get protection. And that's the only way I could get it. As sad as that sounds, um, I understood that, but now he's stuck with those things basically for the rest of his life, and he may or may not be. Uh, I don't believe he was um, as racist as those symbols would indicate, and so we've got that too. I, you know, if you go into any of our prisons, Senator Campbell, prison Senator prison. Senator Campbell on the floor mm -hmm. of the Senate, I recall him uh, mm -hmm. making a uh, very similar recounting a similar tale of someone who had gone in and then the structures within prisons and of course some of it might be because the person doesn't want to be assaulted but others are influenced by the people around them and I think that you know the issue of elected officials you know when when we see some of these um, you know propaganda flyers spray paint whatever it is the public rightly looks to us and says what are you going to do about it and you know, sometimes it's easier for us to pass laws about what happens when someone gets caught. It's a lot harder to root out the things at the core. And I think the Indigenous Peoples Bill, just as a small example, and I, you know, I, maybe I didn't appreciate it fully at the time, um, but that curriculum-based approach is going to be at least one piece of helping, I think, as we move forward, making sure that the curriculum starts to tell a broader story. Um, and the Human Rights Commission, um, you know, Joe was the chair of the Human Rights Commission, and um, I think without disparaging the, the, the predecessors, I think Bor Yang is actually really um, infusing it with like a new uh, new set of eyes uh, to help look at it more systematically. Yeah, um, nothing comes out of this conversation is more another than helping us as public officials to respond better to the divisions yeah. we see in our own communities. And I, I will say that I've seen the Bennington community divided more on this issue than I, on, you know, and it's, it's very difficult. Yeah. And, uh, All right. Well, thank you, guys. Thank you. Did you want to introduce our first witness? Well, is he here? Well, he's here. Oh, me. Well, I'm not sure. Is he first on the list? Oh, well, he is.
Well, yeah, so uh, I'll just say um, I knew him as Dahe, but I don't know what you professionally go by. But um, uh, at my time at UVM, um, we were there at the same time. We weren't close friends, but knew each other well enough. And um, uh, when we were reaching out to see who might have some interesting perspectives on uh, what's going on, particularly with young people who are starting to maybe exhibit uh, some signs of being influenced or heading down some uh, sort of mental roads that um, uh, are regrettable. Um, Dahi was one of the people who was uh, singled out as doing interventions with young people in particular and uh, thought that he might have a kind of an on-the-ground, human-level uh, set of experiences to share that might be uh, particularly helpful. So I'll Great. hand it off. Welcome. Nice Thank you. Get rid of my gum. No, no problem. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you all very much for having this. Thank you. I'm Dick Sears. Hi there. My name is Nadahe. Oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Cool. I'm Jeanette White, and we met when yes. you testified on the slavery amendment. Yes, hi. I'm Phil Baruth. I'm also from Chitty County. Alice Nitko, Windsor County. Hello. Thank you very much. I prepared a little outline, and I won't take up too much of your time, but happy to um, take questions, too. Um, try to be short, but, but yes, I, I work directly with uh, folks in Vermont who, have, who hold white supremacist uh, thinking and hateful ideology and want to speak to that. Um, if I could quickly say, I, um, you know, me, I had the pleasure of meeting um, yeah. Senator Ash at UVM, where I got a, a degree, I got a bachelor's degree in sociology with a concentration in, in uh, uh, race and, and criminology. And I grew up as a white skin privileged person in Lindenville, Vermont, in the 80s and 90s, but as a part of a, a mixed race family, an interracial family, and sort of had a, an interesting front seat to watching um, <coughs> people's lives be curtailed by the violence and rhetoric of our neighbors. And are you a relative of Sally? Sally, I'm Sally's kid. Yep. Yep. <coughs> and um, uh, and in the last 25 years, since since we were at college, I, I have worked with white with folks with white supremacist ideology. Um, 25 years on job sites because I I have worked as a as a laborer, a builder, and and subcontractor, and landscaper. And in the last five years, and so in that capacity, I've worked with a few dozen folks who hold these ideas. In the last five years, I have uh, been working with kids, maybe 20-ish kids who, who hold white supremacist ideologies in their heads and, and act out on them. Um, I, I feel a great responsibility to speak uh, to the context in which this is happening really quickly um, and, and to say that um, racist violence and white supremacist hate groups grow out of our white supremacy culture proper. Um, and a deep history of white violence with all too frequent impunity, okay? Um, and that, that is a consistent piece of our lives and history throughout this entire country to this point. In the last few decades, um, we've been seeing white supremacist hate groups make mainstream some of the narratives that 20 and 30 years ago were only existing on the very, very far right. So ideas like white vulnerability, white genocide, and white replacement um, you know, 20, 30 years ago, you could not hear those ideas really necessarily in these houses, this, this, these spaces, okay? Um, words, terms like invaders, hordes, waves, criminals, animals, surges, when talking about human beings, is something that we didn't really entertain. And now, um, we have, uh, we hear that in the U.S. House, U.S. Congress, out of the White House, and television all the time. So these things are connected, and I just wanted to make that connection. And so, um, so we're in a situation where we have hate groups and hateful acts increasing. I'm not going to be the one to speak to the national numbers or state numbers, but we know that's part of why we're here right now. Um, and that these ideas are becoming mainstream, more mainstream at the same time. So one of the things that I see happening to educators is that even educators who want to do something about it, I see them feeling timid and hand-tied really worried that they will be seen as partisan or feeding into a negative political climate. So even when a kid is Heil Hitlering in a classroom, and people are unaware of how and where to go with it, worried about backlash, that they, that, um, even just about key pieces of dignity like that. Um, and that I see educators who are without tools or direction to deal with the problem. That's what it feels like to me. 
So, so we're in a situation where marginalized groups, uh, the risk to marginalized groups is compounded. Okay, we have on the one hand an increased chance of attack, insult, and denial of rights. We have a history of, uh, of violence, and we have a, a current condition of white supremacy culture. Um, we have a current and historic combination of, this is a compounding, of institutions that criminalize people of color while refusing to study, monitor, or even categorize as criminal the behaviors of white supremacist groups and, and people. That's kind of, and, and I would love if you have questions to speak on that in more depth, but I don't want to take the time now to get into the weeds of that necessarily. Um, so I'm going to say that even though it is, you know, I would definitely say that white supremacist hate groups and the ideologies behind them need to be thought of, monitored, paid more attention to, I also want to say that, that this is ultimately not a policing issue. Um, as horrible as interpersonal racist acts are systemic racism, and the racialization and criminalization of poverty is at the root and is as old as our country and as American as apple pie and is very much what needs to be dealt with in a proactive way. And that we, myself, you all, in my estimation, are every bit as much the problem as white supremacist groups proper because we're sitting here dealing with the status quo and we have not yet figured out how to get ahead of this, how to be proactive and, and how to do the work that we need to do in our educational facilities. So thank you for that. <clears throat> for that little contextualization. I'd like to speak directly to what I've been talking with kids about and what I've been seeing in the schools, okay? Um, I'm a known racial justice activist in my community, right? If anything, I'm getting acted out against about that. I am not, I do not have kids come up to me and say, hey, by the way, like I'm a part of um, this horrific group here. <laughs> what I do know is that the language and ideas of the farthest right are emulated to a T and to a word by children in our schools. I know that the media of white supremacist hate groups is consumed by the children in our schools and by adults in our community. Um, I have noticed a significant change, and I actually was talking to uh, Attorney General um, Donovan about this, that you know we have this kind of understanding that we know that racism and bigotry stems from fear and misunderstanding. And we've seen a, the tradition of uh, the fear and misunderstanding of one family member sort of carrying on to a next family member. But what I'm seeing happening in the community now that I did not see growing up is um, that rather than that cycle just being perpetuated, that now when, those, when that fear and misunderstanding is put onto a child, they are being um, uh, targeted in their video games because you know, the video game is not just against the TV, it's the internet and all everywhere. They're being recruited. Uh, there are sophisticated ideologies out there for them to touch base with, and that the, basically the sophistication of the level of their hateful arguments, uh, their determination to feel them, and their feeling that there is a community that supports <coughs> it is something that feels entirely different. I did not experience that as a child, and I feel like we're incredibly behind the eight ball regarding that in particular. If we're thinking that this is just a holdover of how people deal with fear and misunderstanding, we're, we're woefully misinformed about what's happening. Um, so to speak to that, I've, I've seen inside the schools uh, an increase in a few different sort of categories of behavior, and I'll, I'll sort of tell you what they are, and, I'll, and, and if you'd like, I'll speak directly to some of the experiences of that. So in, this con in the context that I've set up for you and everything, I have seen an increase in uh, fear and vulnerability of, of these white students, okay? Uh, these students fear Sharia law, they fear a liberal takeover, such that they are worried that they are gonna lose their rights to hunt, their access to guns, they're worried that they're going to lose their access to camouflage and to the, the American flag. Okay, that like there's an increase in conspiracy theories among these kids too. And so, you know, I had I was talking with a kid recently about the new law in Vermont that, that helps make sure that a woman has got access to family planning. That a kid was misunderstanding that to say that was telling me that the state of Vermont had just made legal the aborting of a child who's already been born. And I had to talk to a kid and tell them that there's already statutes against murder 
and that we already protect the life of an unborn baby once they're past the stage of viability. Like, the, the, those facts didn't mean anything, okay? The, so an increase in fear and vulnerability, an increase in conspiracy theories. You know, I, I have had um, kids tell me that they thought that all Muslims were under a religious edict to murder them and that they slept with guns under their bed, fearing even old ladies in hijabs. Um, and this is directly communicated to me by children in our schools. Um, I see an increase in dehumanization and othering. I've seen a refusal to give a moment of silence to the Tree of Life victims in Pittsburgh. Um, I have heard kids say, uh, people deserve what they get. It's old history, get over it. See the term Mexican used as an insult rather than as a nationality. And we actually see nationally that Fox News earlier this week was talking about three Mexican countries. Not a single one of those countries was actually Mexico. And that that is part of that understanding and dehumanizing of, of people and how mainstream it is that we have that going on. Um, I had a kid tell me they couldn't wait to uh, join the military so that he could kill and torture people. He didn't really care where, who they were or for what reason he was able to do that. I have seen an increase in Confederate flag and swastika displays on belts, shirts, computer screens, cars, trucks, on flagpoles and porches in Hardwick, Lindenville, Morrisville, and Glover. And that's just because that's where I commute to go to work <laughs> and to do my thing. Um, I have seen an increase in resentment and anger over any representation at all. And, and this is rooted in a white supremacy culture proper that, again, I would love to speak to if it made sense at a later time, but that um, uh, I have seen kids who refuse to read books by or about black people. I've heard kids say, I'm sick of thinking about people of color. What about white people? Um, I have had heard kids walk out of presentations, anti-LGBTQ <coughs> bullying, walk out of presentations because they refuse to be brainwashed into being gay. Um, <clears throat> I've seen an increase in vandalism and threats, right? Graffiti, Hardwick, um, Marshfield, Glover, Lindenville, Berlin. I've seen an increase in uh, threats. This is all anecdotal. This is my experience, but this, this is what I'm seeing. An increase in threats in Hardwick, Craftsbury, Stowe, Montpelier, Lindenville. Okay, this is all in recent years, and I, I have to report, but I'm I'm sad to report that, um, in my personal outreach to to the law enforcement community, I have been met. I don't want to want to use terms. I have too frequently been met with. Uh, a mix up between minimization and victim blaming. And I'm happy to speak to specific incidents about that if you'd like as well. Um, no. I don't want to get into every specific incident. Yeah. I'm uh -huh. trying to get, yeah. understand the geographic area that yeah. you kind of cover. Is it mainly the Northeast Kingdom? Mainly in the Northeast Kingdom. I live in Cabot and I. And, you, and, I, and I, you know, we have a representative from Mont State Police here. Yep. I'm sure we have to talk to you about. And we may. Yeah. Yeah. you've met, and uh -huh. uh, also Julio Thompson from the Attorney General's office. That, uh, we are trying to put together some kind of a basic reporting system for eight incidents. Yep. So what, exactly what you're talking about, but I had never heard that, and I've not ever heard any press or any information about this in the kingdom. Mm -hmm. They've mainly been hearing about Bennington. Yeah, um, right. And you know, and in this issue, we do. Yeah, we do. You know, you'll see things on the on the paper, and then they go away. I mean, Glover two years ago, there were swastikas and anti-black graffiti spray painted in seven different locations over one night. And um, I was told by the police the next day that I should expect that nothing was really going to be found because they're hard to figure out. Um, and I just don't. It doesn't seem like that is the response that. We, I expect to get about crime stuff, so, but I don't need to get further no, into I that in that moment. But yes, yeah, thank you. And we've heard, other than Stowe I, and Burlington, I've heard little yeah. of any you know, racist issues. Yeah. Uh, to, uh, I'm glad to get to be here and shed a light on that because uh, within our communities, we talk about it a lot. The, 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 yeah. uh, the, the folks have seemed to concentrate on a couple of issues and not the broad. Yes. Sense that you have of the pervasiveness. Of yeah. State. Stowe and Bennington got particular press, but these right, things yeah. happen and on lots, so I, lots and lots of levels, and and a lot of times people are intimidated away from even dealing with the, um, with law enforcement community. Like um, we had uh, 
in one of the little small towns that I deal with, um, a girl had been bullied, a girl had been punched and told that by the boy who punched her that he could do anything he wanted because pre Trump is president now. And I was told by that girl that she didn't actually feel comfortable approaching the police because the local police officer had a, a Trump sign in his yard. I tried to communicate that, you know, it's a very interesting, difficult set of situations, but the fact that we hear about Stowe and the fact that we hear about Bennington, I'm really glad then to be here to let us know, no, 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 no. You, that's, that's a teeny little bit of what is going on in this state. Um, so, so thanks, and then is there any more questions about that? I would love to, if I could, just end quickly by saying, um, Dehumanization begets dehumanization. We know historically that as, as violence against folks of color increases, all marginalized groups suffer and, and violence in general increases, right? That, that gang violence, group violence against folks of color is directly correlates historically with, with group violence against women, for instance, okay? And so um, we gotta wonder about all of us in our community when this happens, right? Racist violence and white supremacist hate is not a niche issue of marginalized groups of people. It is not a niche issue of people of color. It is a key societal destabilizer. And that right now, race and racism is being used in the exact same way that it was created and invented for in the 1600s, which is to separate the masses of working people so that they can be thieved from and controlled. You know, racist violence is a smoke screen that allows criminality and theft at the highest levels of our society. It's, that's why we have this race as a social construct. It is not a real biological thing. I, I, you cannot tell whether I have black blood or white blood in me. There's no such thing. You, you see what I'm saying? And that it's this history that feeds the situation that we're in. White supremacist terror that we're suffering as a society is a the the sensible outgrowth of our history and, and what we've done. I guess my question yep. is, uh, I grew up in the Boston area, and it was a famous area for school busing. And yeah. I, I was a fan of the Red Sox, and the Red Sox certainly were known for its prejudice in the yeah. 50s and 60s in terms of integration. Uh, but in in that area, you know, we, we focused on on Boston in particular, and then I, as a kid, kid, when I was deciding what to do when I had left the University of Vermont temporarily at their request, um, I went to work in a warehouse called Zayers. Nobody here who's under 50 will remember Zayers, but they were the forerunner of Walmart and all those. And so at that warehouse, because it was hard to get workers in the suburbs, they bust people in from Boston, and many of whom were black. And that was my first experience with a large, actually there were more blacks working there than, than whites. And I learned an awful lot. Um, but I didn't learn enough, obviously, to be able to know how to <coughs> confront this in my own community, but you're confronting. And so, I don't know, maybe I've inartfully asked you the question, so what is, for those of us who are leaders in our communities, or at least we think we are, yeah. um, who um, absolutely condemn this behavior, what, you know, what is, what are some suggestion, suggestions of Thank how you. we can deal with this? Yeah. And then as a committee, we've had an extremely difficult time in trying to uh, come together on many of these issues to try to, um, you know, get views on both sides. So we're, we're kind of... Um, mm -hmm. Well, I could make some, I'll, I'll give you some I don't suggestions. Know, I, I don't know if you got my question. I, I think I do, like where do we go, what do we do? What do we do with what yeah. we have? And so, so I would say right off the bat, you know, like uh, uh, me, and uh, I would say first we need to, we need to um, listen to folks of color. We need to believe people of color and other marginalized folks as to what's going on in the community and to take suggestions directly from people of color in our communities. Um, I know that I think that the, the H3, the Ethnic Studies Bill that just passed, there's, it's nothing prescriptive yet. It is the beginning of a process. And I think that one of the things that we could do is to absolutely put all of our weight and power behind what that means to build toward that, because there will be pushback and there will be backlash, you know. Um, I think that supporting 
any and all of the racial equity and, and racial justice legislation that is currently out there and, though I would say, being endorsed by uh, Vermont Racial Justice Alliance is important. Um, n you know, uh, not just, uh, I don't need to get in further than that, but, but basically to be listening to folks of color, to be making those moves and supporting what we do have legislatively going on. And then I would furthermore to say, we all sort of like, we need work on every single level about this, right? Like, like we're woefully sort of misunderstand as a society um, where our ideas of race came from, how we treat race, and how it works out to this day. So, so like, there's an educational component both like inside me, inside you, inside you, and there's an educational component institutionally, right? Like within our schools to, to really have an entirely different approach top to bottom. You know, if I can say part of the thing going on, and this does speak to directly what to do, part of what's going on in white supremacy culture is this. We're a highly racialized society, okay? Highly racialized society, highly, uh, a history of being highly racialized. I'm a white skin privileged person, okay? I exist as a member of a racial group with racial experiences. I'm taught in a white supremacy society to view myself as normal, average, regular, and human, so that my experiences are normal, average, regular, and human. That means all of the experiences of folks of color are seen as bringing race into the table for me, onto the table for me, as polluting my racial neutrality, okay? That is an incredibly harmful, destructive thing that is the base of so much of this violence, okay? And, and we're not taught that on really on any level, so, that, so there's work along those lines really just conceptually and there's a lot of um, you know a lot of the mitigating the hatred that some of these kids feel you know they're really worried that someone's going to come in and take away their camouflage and take away their American flag I mean hey if you're taking away the Confederate flag then the American flag is next that is what they're thinking um, there's a lot of room to have these kids feel better to feel less fear to fear feel less vulnerable they don't you know they're a part of the world. They don't need to fear loving people and competing with people and working with people and living with people. They don't need to. But, but we set them up to fear these things because, because we're here responding to the fact that people bring violence into the community rather than proactively building the educational fortitude you know, for us to avoid running down this line. Is that a little bit? Does that yeah, speak a little that to that? Really helps. Thank you. Um, thank, I thank do you. want to get to the other witnesses, but Joe. Yes, yeah, so thank you very much. Well, I Joe, it took a little bit of time. I appreciate that. that. Your constituent has, I mean, your senator has another Yes. Question. He lives in Cabin now. He's no oh, he's he no longer your constituent. <laughs> well, first, I should say, I sold radio advertising to his heirs many years ago. Um, I don't know if you noticed that I was smiling during some of your testimony because you were talking about the experiences that you had seen and what kids were dealing with directly. The reason that I was smiling was because three years ago I brought a bill here to have the state of Vermont adopt a Latin motto. And the reaction on Facebook was absolutely off the charts mm. about if we do that, we're going to have hordes of Mexicans coming over the border to invade. <coughs> and it, it just went right down the tubes. And in, I don't know what your exact age is, but I'm guessing what you didn't experience as a kid and are experiencing now is a direct correlation to the fact that social media has become the tool of choice. <coughs> so my purpose in bringing this subject is today's Caledonian Record editorial. If you haven't had a chance to read it yet, take I'll a read. Out, it's okay. an open letter from the publisher to Senator Patrick Leahy about what to do about Facebook and how they're treated differently, and yet their content is absolutely poisoning our society today. And uh, it's a fascinating read, so if you haven't had a chance to read it, take a look. I'd love to know what you're doing. I will check that out, and thank you. Thank you all very much for providing the you. time and, and well, just, for just considering. Just to finish my story, I did end up being invited back to the university. <laughs> <laughs> I ended up graduating. <laughs> <laughs> so, Ten year plan. Thank what, you. Is it, what is it that you said you recommended reading? California Records. Okay, today. <clears throat> Skyler, if you want to join us. Um, Skyler Nash, many of the, most of the committee met last week, and uh, we learned a lot more about Skyler. He's here to really talk. He came originally to talk about life without parole and eliminating that, and we will continue.
continue that conversation next year, assuming the university invites you back. <laughs> <laughs> uh, oh, they will. I sure hope so. <laughs> too. And actually, if you have some time during the break, if we could talk to Bryn about a, a bill and we can start to work on that process, which would be, uh, which is really why you came here. Yeah. But today, when you were talking with us, you as a student athlete at the University of Vermont, um, you have some particular experiences that you wanted to share with the committee, and we're happy to share with you. Yeah, no, thank you uh, for having me back. Um, so basically, a little bit about my background is I grew up in the city of Chicago. Can you your name for the record so oh, they know who you are? Skylar Nash, a uh, student athlete at the University of Vermont. Um, I grew up in Chicago on the south side of the city. Uh, but I attended my elementary school on the north side of the city, and for those of you who aren't familiar with kind of the racial breakdowns of the city, the south and west sides are predominantly black and brown people, uh, low-income areas uh, for the most part. And the north side of the city where I attended elementary school, particularly the Lakeview, Wrigleyville uh, areas are <clears throat> affluent neighborhoods, predominantly white spaces. And so going through my elementary education, uh, it was a particularly unique experience, I think, for me because I would leave these predominantly black and brown spaces and go to school where I was uh, oftentimes like the only one, as I'd like to say, like the only person of color in a classroom uh, at a house. And for a lot of the times with my peers, I was like their first, in a way, either the first person of color that they met or the first person of color that they had spent, um, you know, significant time around. And that led to a lot of experiences that I didn't know how to characterize them back then, but as I got into high school and college now, I knew them to be microaggressions, kind of the things of, you know, students coming and touching my hair, grabbing you know, the top of my hair and saying, wow, like it feels just like a dog's hair, like this is crazy, like without asking me, or coming back from vacations on spring break, like, hey, let's compare, let's see whose skin is darker, like that type of thing. And at the time, it, for me, it was just like white people being white people, right? I was just like, oh, this is kind of just how it is, this is how it is at school. But as I got older and gotten into high school and college, I knew them to be what they are, which is microaggressions that were shaping my experience and, and um, kind of learning how to navigate predominantly white spaces as a person of color, particularly as a young black man. Um, and as I got into high school, I started to further uh, investigate and become an advocate for racial and social justice. Um, I wasn't shy about making that known on social media and, and in spaces and trying to educate myself on how to be a better advocate um, off the court. At, and so during my recruiting process, you know, this was no secret to coaches that were recruiting me. Um, and as the University of Vermont quickly rose to the top of my list in terms of schools that I was considering, um, my mom was definitely concerned about sending me to a state that we all know is one of the whitest states in the country and the university. Uh, reflects that in terms of the makeup of the students. Uh, but at the end of the day, there were a couple things that made her and myself comfortable knowing that I'd be okay going to the university. One, I had that experience of navigating predominantly white spaces and, um, and, and being the only person in a room. And I was comfortable doing that just based off of experience. I felt like I knew how to do it. I knew how to navigate those spaces. But secondly, my coaches did a fantastic job of when I came on my visit to the school not only showing me the winning culture and tradition that is associated with the basketball program and the family atmosphere that is what made it rise to the top of my list, but also connecting me with people who could help me further <clears throat> investigate my interests off the court in racial and social advocacy and justice, but also just somebody that I could call up and come into their office and just share the lived experience that is being a person of color in a predominantly white space. And so I met Beverly Colston, the director of the Mosaic Center uh, for Students of Color, and Alex Yin, um, and all these different professors and people that I could add to my list and know, okay, once I get to this school, these are people that I can come into contact with and know that you understand what I'm going through. You share that experience that is so unique. Um, and so once I got to school, I was able to leverage those connections to meet with leaders in the Black Student Union and other minority groups to kind of just get a better feel of, okay, once I get outside of this bubble that is athletics, because as an athlete, you I start to learn that people treat you differently, right? I remember in high school, there was a big deal about uh, a father of a kid who was on Facebook saying, man, the basketball team is full of all these section eighters now, and, and what happened to all the white players, and blah, 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 blah. 
And once I found out who the guy was, I recognized that he had been cheering at every game. He had been to every game that season after games and come up, Skyler, man, you're great, man, that type of thing. So you recognize that when you're in that bubble, you're not necessarily getting the full experience of other people of color in those spaces. And so I wanted to get uh, a, you know, a handle on what was going on in Vermont. And one thing that they shared with me and that I came to realize myself is that you have a lot of well-intentioned people who um, want to help. And, and when you talk to them about race, they say, well, I don't, I don't look at race. Right? I, I don't see color. And to them, that's like a really good thing. They're like, yeah, I don't see color. I don't recognize that. But um, you know, the students and the Black Student Union and, and myself trying to have conversations with people to let them know that that becomes a huge problem when trying to address because the reality is, is that we live in a highly racialized society, as we heard earlier. And so when you say, when you try to be good intentioned by saying, I don't see color, you're ultimately going to become part of the problem. Um, and they brought to my attention some of the issues that had happened, been happening on campus, like the stealing of the Black Lives Matter flag um, from around the Davis Center. And there had been a Mosaic Center display uh, that had been graffitied with white supremacy signage and, and uh, memos and flyers. And those are all you know, small acts um, that you wouldn't think of necessarily maybe as like major hate crimes. But they are little things that contribute to making the climate of the school less inclusive for people of color and, and making them feel unsafe in the climate. And so later on in, the, in my freshman year, we had a game against St. Mike's, uh, which is a typical rivalry game for us. And, yeah, I do remember that. Yeah. And before the game, our coaches came to us and told us that the St. Mike's coaches had alerted them that a, a group of their players were going to take a knee during the anthem uh, in a silent protest against police brutality nationally. And we didn't think of it as a big deal. A lot of us were you know, familiar with this issue from Colin Kaepernick and the NFL, and um, we all respected their right to protest and said, OK, they'll do that, and we'll get on with the game. Once it happened before the game, our predominantly white home crowd responded by booing them, cursing them, telling them to stand up, really hateful things coming from our crowd. And like you said, uh, things that we would never hear as you know, athletes of color, because they're our home crowd. They love us. They have no reason to do that to us. But then when these other student athletes of color and just regular student athletes um, came and, and exercised their right to protest, they responded in that hateful, negative way. And I know it shook up my coaches, it shook up my teammates, um, the entire athletic department. It was a huge deal. And this was my first in, uh, experience with our athletic department. And I was really proud to say that our athletic director and the administration did a good job of inviting us to be a part of the discussions of how do we respond to this? Um, how do we let people know that this isn't what we stand for, this isn't OK? And so we made a number of changes. We wore warm-up shirts um, with love, respect, and togetherness uh, before games. We linked arms during the national anthem. We added a message before the games talking about conduct and how to handle yourselves when you're at our games. But after the season, I think one of the biggest uh, action steps that the athletic director, Jeff Shulman, took was he formed an Athletics Inclusive Excellence Committee um, that was going to be able to specifically examine the climate and the athletic department at the university um, and whether it needed to be improved and how to improve it. And so he invited me to be on that committee. Uh, and one of the first things that we did as a committee is administer a department-wide climate survey and the responses were anonymous, but they were categorized based on race, gender, sport. Um, and with the help of the, uh, Dr. Alex Yen, the director of institutional research, um, we were able to get those numbers back and found, unsurprisingly, probably, that student athletes of color in the department disproportionately felt unincluded in the climate. And so it was nice to have those numbers. Not nice because they aren't saying what you want them to say, right? And I think it was a little bit of a shock to some of the other members of the committee because they're like, this is Vermont. This, our, you know, our climate is inclusive. We try to include everybody. That's what we stand for, which is true. But that's not always going to result in a climate that is inclusive for everybody. And so we wanted to get better context for these numbers that we were looking at. So uh, along with Beverly Colston, the director of the Mosaic Center, uh, Dr. Alex Sin, and myself, we held a focus group for student athletes of color just to bring them in because the reality was, I was I'm the only person of color on the Committee of Inclusive Excellence, right? And so I like to think that I think about these issues a lot, and, and I have my own lived experience as a student athlete of color at this university, but I can't speak for every 
person of color, a student athlete of color, nor would I want to, uh, because you know our experiences can be similar, but it's unique for every single person and the issues that they're facing. And so we were able to bring in um, the student athletes and just talk to them about what has been your experience here in Vermont, coming from home, um, on your teams, and a lot of what they talked about was that pressure and the weight of being the only, either on their team, at a game, on a bus, uh, feeling the pressure that I, I'm meeting, uh, my teammate, this is the first time that they spent uh, significant time around a person of color. I know that if I mess up, that's going to inform their view of people that look like me for the rest of their lives. And talking about what that weight means for you know anybody, but particularly an 18, 19 year old kid. Um, and talking about, like I said earlier, microaggressions, like you know, recognizing that you kind of don't have uh, your identity isn't recognized as much on campus. You're going to be mistaken for other uh, student athletes of color. I tell you what, I went into the dining hall with my friend Anthony. Uh, every single time I walk in there, uh, the guy comes, oh, Anthony Lamb, I'm like, how are you doing, man? I'm like, listen, I don't look anything like Anthony Lamb. He's two inches taller than me. His hair is this big. Like, you recognize that we are two different people. So every time I come in, you ask me about Rochester. I'm not Anthony, dude. I'm sorry. <laughs> and, and that's something that, that was a common experience for a lot of the people that we were talking to, but you wouldn't necessarily, they felt alone in that experience because they hadn't had the chance to talk to anybody that had been going through that on campus. And so one of the big things that I took away from that meeting was that, you know, we needed to do work to address um, the microaggressions and the negative things that were impacting the climate, but a big thing that we needed to do was to take action to create a space for student athletes of color in the department to connect with one another and re realize that there were people that were living that same experience on campus as them and give them a space to connect um, and, and bond over that. And so what we did was uh, create a monthly kind of like meeting space, safe space, whatever you want to call it, uh, for student athletes of color to come together, uh, meet each other, play you know, games, uh, have potlucks, and um, but more importantly, use it as a time to connect them with some of the groups for marginalized communities on campus outside of the bubble that is athletics. Because what I realized after meeting with a lot of them was that my experience on my visit with meeting all these people that could, uh, with the Mosaic Center and different professors, was completely unique. Nobody else had had that on one of their visits. It's that when they came here, they looked at you know the facility, they talked about athletics and, and school, but that was it. They didn't know about the Mosaic Center. They didn't know about the Asian Student Union, the Black Student Union. They had no idea how to connect with those groups, even if they wanted to. And so that can contribute to them feeling in that climate of, oh, I'm, I'm alone, I don't know how to, how to further ingratiate myself to get with people who can help me do this. And so we wanted to use that space to bring the leaders of those groups in to talk about, here's how you get connected with the Mosaic Center, the Asian Student Union, the Black Student Union. Uh, well, you're leading me to a question. You're an athlete, but you're a student probably first, or I hope. Um, uh, are you treated differently as an athlete than you are as a student uh, at, at, in the community, in the Burlington community? Uh, you know, oh. you, um, you're kind of treated as a hero as an athlete. Yeah. You went to the NWCA tournament, blah, blah, blah. You know, good team and so forth. Uh, do you find that difference and how do you deal with it? No, I think, like I said earlier, you recognize that there, like we talk about privilege, there's racial privilege, there's you know economic privilege, and there is privilege in being an athlete um, that I have over regular students on campus. Like I said, we are we our experience is in a bubble, right? You know, I see myself as I identify as a young black man, but when I'm out on Burlington and we have our UVM gear on and we're walking in a group, somebody that may treat a group like us that wasn't on the team differently is going to treat us with a level of respect just because we're on their favorite team. And like you said, we made it to March Madness and we win all these games. And so we're not necessarily always privy to all the issues with the climate or the community around us just because we have that level of privilege. And so part of um, my goal with this committee was to come back to the uh, chairs of the committee, Kathy Rahill and Joe Gervais, 
and kind of help them recognize that like we all live in this bubble that is athletics and so when we have people who are so in awe of what we're doing not just on the basketball team but they see you as athletic directors and they're so happy we're not always going to see the true experience of a person of color in that community and so we need to go to as many people per, uh, of color and try to get an, a handle of what is like what is really going on here and, and empower them to come to us and tell us this is how we address these problems. I find it fascinating. You're the only member of public yeah. on that group. To deal we, we had one other, um, Chris Day, who was the women's coach uh, two years ago, but uh, resigned. And so once he left the school, I was the only person of color on the committee, which is kind of ironic, but it is also a reality um, you know, for the state and for the school. Yeah, one of the um, Years ago, I was involved in a bill called Civil Union, which stirred the country, really, and, and the world, I think, in terms of recognizing the rights of gays and lesbians to marry and to... Um, and, and it was a civil rights issue, no question about it. And Senator Nitka was on the House Judiciary Committee at the time, and, and both of us took an awful lot of hate and the messages and things. It was before the, it was really kind of, the civil unions was really before the internet. So most of our stuff came in papers and I donated yeah. emails. boxes. Yeah. Well, we had emails, but I donated boxes of material just because of the level of hate that we saw. Um, and I can remember marching in a battle day parade, being yelled at with, race, with epitaphs regarding gay and lesbian. So I experienced that, I understand that. But you know, I have not been able personally to evidently, for some people, say it strong enough. My, my disgust with some of the hate things that have been going on in this state, and particularly in my hometown. Um, and that was one of the reasons that I was happy that Senator Ash suggested doing this, and I don't know if you have suggestions for us in dealing with what is a pervasive problem in our communities, and we are obviously, I'm a white Anglo-Saxon Protestant, which is probably the... Yeah, no, I think that what I would say to you all is the same thing that I said when um, Beverly, Dr. Alex, uh, Ian and I met with uh, the chairs of our committee, is that, um, you know, the the climate that exists in the athletic department on campus and our communities is the result of intentional actions and, and you know that had serious intentions. And if we're going to be serious about making our climate more inclusive, it's going to take equally intentional actions to change it, um, like making this a safe space for student athletes of color, like uh, structuring visits to make the school more um, attractive to prospective student athletes of color. Um, we need to, if we're going to be serious about making the climate more inclusive, we have to listen to student athletes of color, people of color, come in and empower them to leadership positions and to be a part of discussions like this, uh, committees like the Athletics Inclusive Excellence Committee, uh, to give suggestions, to give information about the realities of the climate that we're not always privy to, um, you know, regardless, of, due to our privilege, whether, wherever that might be. Uh, other, other questions for Scott? Yeah, a couple, actually. First off, going back to your days growing up, um, one of the tools that tried to eliminate this problem was forced busing. Were you actually part of the forced busing routine in Chicago? No. Um, I, my parents would take me up Lakeshore Drive um, from, from our home, and, and we would roll up. I always said that it, it was funny for me growing up because we would come in, in my school. It was like like a car show at the beginning. I'd like to drop off. Everybody would be, the big thing was like uh, big black Suburbans that everybody would roll up in and all the soccer moms and, and everybody. And you could hear my mom's town and country coming from like a mile away from the brakes. <laughs> would be squealing and stuff. You know, one time um, I was uh, staying after school with the vice principal, uh, one of the few times uh, in elementary school, 
And I told her, I think my mom's here. And she said, how do you know that? Because I can hear the brakes coming up the street. Uh, and so in this whole parade of black suburbans, you can hear the rusty town and country squealing up. Um, so yeah, no, I wasn't a part of the, the forced busing. So you're, you are now in a bubble called college. Yeah. And one of the hardest things that I know I had to learn was that there's actually life after college. Right. And when you get out of that bubble, you have um, a, an experience, especially as an athlete, leading um, a good discussion from a black person's perspective. <coughs> the ultimate solution is not using government to force us into eliminating our tribal barriers, but rather investing individuals with the desire to cross those lines. What would entice a person like you to move to the Northeast Kingdom? Sure. Yeah. Have you ever actually been to the Northeast? Um, I think I may have driven through. Um, <laughs> That's a but, good thing to do. Yeah. <laughs> but honestly, you know, like when you talk about coming, just first the first step coming and then staying, um, just even for the state in general, like I was telling my friend last night, it, you know, five years ago, if you had told me that I was going to be in Vermont, even just going to school here, it would have been... I might have even said, like, Vermont, what is, like, Vermont? But I'm trying to think, like, oh, Vermont, okay, yeah, yeah. New York turned left. Yeah, right, yeah. Um, but now, you know, two years in, I told her, like, I could see myself staying here because I think it's a unique opportunity, like you said, for rather than the government coming and forcing people to change their ways, because I don't think that that's really sustainable long term uh, when you're forcing people to do something you have to force on people. but. Ultimately, you want to bring about change organically in a way that's going to stay there long term. And when you talk about people who are willing to invest in crossing those lines and, and trying to institute that change, I think that Vermont, um, particularly from my experience, presents a unique opportunity for people like that because you have um, people in government, people in leadership in the schools that uh, are aware of the problems, maybe not always in full. Um, but they're aware that there is a problem, and they have the power to help change those problems, um, but they don't always have the answers, but they're willing to admit that they don't always have the answers and empower people who do and who may. And that's certainly been my experience in the athletic department and uh, with the university as a whole, and so I think that uh, that presents a unique opportunity for the people that you're describing, and I'd like to think of myself as one of those people. Um, to be empowered to have those conversations and to help bring about that change. Well, I, I hope you do stay in Vermont. And I hope you, after you graduate, uh, and I hope you know, that you'll remain involved in the Vermont community. Um, it can only be a positive experience. Maybe you could run for the Senate. <laughs> and maybe you can move out of Chittenden <clears throat> County because we'd love yeah. to have you other places. Well, no, I'm staying here this summer instead of going back home uh, now that I'm living off campus. So I was telling uh, my friend Sam Donnelly um, at the school, you know, because he grew up in Vermont, said, I want to explore the state a little bit more and get out of Burlington well, and see what else there is. Let us know. But, Absolutely. Uh, uh, if you can stick around, uh, yeah. if you, unless you have to leave, Brittany, you and I can talk a little okay. bit about the other. Yeah, absolutely. If you can the Northeast Kingdom, <laughs> there is the very first black member of this legislature was a guy named Alexander Twilight, who was an educator from Orleans County, the town of Browning, the school that he built slowly. And I often think about not only did he have the courage to come there, but he had the courage to remain. And by living a simple life of good example, is the best way for his neighbors to eventually evaporate any of their biases that they had. And I, I struggle with that because you just don't have a whole lot of folks that are of color moving to the kingdom. Yeah. And I was talking all about that story. Your mom was a, a pretty good example. I mean, she not only came, but had the courage to stay despite what was going on around her. And if you have the opportunity to become one of the leaders of making that happen, eventually we'll be a much better place. Thank you. Thank you, Scholar. Thank you. I appreciate you taking Thank time you. to come down here again. Thank uh, you. Next witness is Julio Thompson. Civil <coughs> rights. I'll let you give your title. I always get it stopped down. Here. <coughs> Director of the Civil Rights Unit of the State Attorney General's Office. Yes, yeah, good morning. Julio Thompson, Assistant Attorney General and Director of the Attorney General's Civil Rights Unit. 
Uh, well, thank you for inviting me today. Uh, I think what we've heard a lot of valuable information on a very large and persistent problem um, dealing with uh, hate crimes and, uh, and bias incidents, which might be non-criminal acts that are nonetheless uh, intimidating to individuals um, and that might limit individuals' opportunities uh, in education or in employment or housing. Um, uh, Senator Benning, I think, brought up, up a point that I think it is worth emphasizing, which is, you know, what is different now than, say, uh, America 30 years ago uh, or 25 years ago? Um, it's not clear, and I'm not a criminologist or, or a statistician, but, um, you know, back in the, in the 1990s, when I lived in Los Angeles, was practicing civil rights law in Los Angeles. On the 50th anniversary of Pearl Harbor, there was a wave of hate crimes against the Japanese American community uh, in Los Angeles, uh, acts of violence and vandalism that persisted throughout the year. Um, sometimes these things go in waves. There are, there are periods and cycles where it seems to be that there are, there are rises and dips. Uh, and it's not clear to anyone whether the level of hatred and bias has really changed or whether uh, there, are, there are events that occur in the country or statements that are made by uh, political leaders or events that occur either na nationally or internationally that spark um, that behavior that creates sort of a permission structure for people to step out of what otherwise might be uh, community norms that, that keep their, their thoughts uh, or that, that have them keep their thoughts to themselves. One real difference, of course, is um, we have the internet now, and so the ability of individuals who subs either are members of or are sympathetic to hate groups is much easier um, than it was a long time ago. There are um, numerous websites and, and social media platforms that cater exactly to um, ideologies of racial hatred, anti-Semitism, Islamophobia, homophobia, on down the line. And those are accessible now with the advent and affordability of smartphones. Those are accessible to anyone in their back pocket. Um, and, um, and there's little that um, parents can do once their children are out in the world to handle what's on those phones. Um, but what we, we also have seen is over time is that in terms of public figures, the bully pulpit does matter. Um, this January, I was um, uh, lucky enough to attend a conference on hate crimes enforcement uh, sponsored by the National Association of Attorneys General. And we had presentations there from people who spent their careers studying hate groups and uh, waves of, of hate-related violence. Um, and one of the, uh, the, the speakers that we, we spent a fair amount of time with was Brian Levin, uh, who's a professor of criminology at the uh, Center for the Study of Hate and Extremism and at San Bernardino. Uh, and he's testified before the, new, the US Congress, I think maybe half a dozen times, about hate groups. And his organization puts out not only data but regarding past years uh, hate crimes and reported in, in states and cities, but also what his group calls, or his school calls, a hate crimes forecast. They try to forecast trends. Uh, and one of the interesting um, uh, points that he made was that he had provi provided us some data, and I don't have that data available uh, to me today, um, showing that there are certain events or certain speeches that are given by individuals that um, affect uh, that what they would do is they would look at um, certain websites like uh, that, that cater to uh, hate ideologies like Gab, for example, which is sort of a, a Twitter um, that is uh, completely unregulated and search for how many anti-Semitic or racist statements that were made uh, in the light of certain speeches by national figures um, over certain events, speeches by, say, Pre President Obama or other political figures. Um, and the, the takeaway was that it does matter. What is going on in the national conversation does matter. Uh, and I think the, uh, that it works both ways. Um, if officials are either unwilling to engage in the issue, so a head-in-the-sand approach, or even a sympathetic 
a sympathetic stance that can create an environment where um, people are more active in, in speaking out um, their hateful views, acting upon them. And in our office, of course, we're the Attorney General's office, so we are limited constitutionally and by statute to dealing with crimes or civil wrongs that can be redressed. Um, what we have seen in Vermont is, uh, in the last couple of years, is a real vitality in community groups that are responding to incidents which, even though they may not violate the law, are nonetheless deeply offensive and intimidating to all members of the community. So, for example, uh, last year uh, there were um, photocopies of Confederate dollar bills that had been slipped into books in the Rutland Free Library. And the response to that, which uh, may not have violated a law, and there were certainly no known offenders. And it was something that had been done in multiple states, I think. Used, people using social media decided to make an organized event of it. Um, but there was a, 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 you know, a big community forum that was sponsored by the NAACP of Rutland and the Rutland Jewish Center, where it was a packed house, uh, and people were there uh, to speak about um, you know, their opposition to that behavior, to hear a little bit about what the law can and cannot do, um, and to connect with each other. Um, and, uh, and, and through that, uh, through that meeting, the people were reporting other incidents that they had experienced or their children had experienced at other colleges, like Castleton Colleges or others in the area. Well, you're Senator. raising one of the difficulties that I have as a, as a leader. And that is, because I chair the Judiciary Committee, many times people expect a law enforcement response. And as we've learned, um, number one, you have to catch the perpetrator. Number two, you have to have evidence that we find that perpetrator guilty beyond a reasonable doubt of whatever the behavior was. So you're talking about rather than maybe a, a criminal justice response, a community-wide response. And, I, and that's where I struggle. I mean, I, I experienced this in Bennington with, you know, the person was well known who targeted a uh, black legislator, um, but there wasn't evidence to uh, convict him, so he wasn't charged with those crimes. Um, <coughs> now, it's so that's difficult for people to understand. It? Well, if the if the police and law enforcement and the attorney general can't protect us, what do we do? Well, I think you hit on the point, which is that it's not, I mean, it's a difficult problem and there isn't one solution. It has to be a multifaceted approach. So where crimes are committed, you need to have a swift and appropriate law enforcement response. But for the incidents that are not criminal, um, there are responses that communities and schools and public leaders can have that don't involve handcuffing people. Well, and, and I, people I look in the back, jail. maybe Bennington's mistake was relying on having a law enforcement response. <clears throat> Should have been having a community-wide response. I, I don't know. I mean, I'm just... um, well, I think the point, the point that, that I'm trying to make here is just that um, it, if where there are limits where the government can act in the criminal justice or the civil system doesn't mean that it's, it's, it's tough luck and there's nothing else you can do. Uh, some organizations that have been focusing on hate uh, on college campuses, for example, the, the Southern Poverty Law Center last or in 2017 put out an excellent guide for, uh, for students and, and campus administrators uh, to give them a toolkit and suggested responses for when either a hate group or sometimes there's a, a single controversial speaker comes to campus and uh, kind of breaks down what are the do's and don'ts. Uh, and if for, one example would be, for example, to have, you know, uh, uh, overreactions where there's uh, either threats of violence or something that can feed into the ideology of victimhoods that a lot of uh, hate groups advocate. Uh, and that's true also in all aspects. If there's something that's an overreaction, so people are counter-protesting but doing so in a non-peaceful way, um, 
with the ubiquity of cell phone cameras that can go on YouTube and be used, and is used, in fact, in propaganda pieces that are put out by organized hate groups. Uh, and that's true also for law enforcement. So um, one of the speakers that we met at, the, uh, at, at this conference um, was a gentleman named T.M. Garrett, who was born in Austria, uh, and this young man was a neo-Nazi and a leader in a neo-Nazi group, as well as a German chapter of the Ku Klux Klan, uh, who, when he came to the United States, um, abandoned those groups and basically fled those groups in Austria and has spent his time uh, in Memphis, Tennessee, uh, working with working to break the cycle of, of the hate, hate group membership in the prisons by, for example, enlisting a network of tattoo artists to cover up or change tattoos for offenders who may, and while in prison, uh, gotten a racist or, let's say, a swastika tattoo, and those individuals come out, and then they're, in, in his view, as, as he said, they're uh, have had real difficulties obtaining employment because well, they're... I mean, if you get a swastika on your forehead, which I actually worked with an offender who was in, still in jail, so he's still not eligible for a job, but who has that on his neck, he's got other places on his body. I can't imagine him getting a job. And part of his organization, that's just one of the things they do, which are these, is this hate tattoo initiative where they have enlisted uh, artists who are willing to donate their services. But one point that he made is just simply that an overreaction, an unlawful response to hate is, is central to their ideology. He said that's how he recruited people. If people lost their jobs or were assaulted, then people who are members of the hate groups uh, that's an opportunity for him, and he referred to some public events that had happened in different parts of the country where he said he attempted to reach out to that part, maybe someone who was exposed as having some sympathies and lost their job or, or their house was vandalized, and he said there was only a matter of days before people who were affiliated with hate groups wouldn't try to reach that person and say, hey, we can give you a job, hey, we can protect you, and that's a central recruiting mechanism. So. Um, I think it has to be a multi, it has to be a nuanced, multifaceted approach. And uh, our office, uh, again, we've been meeting uh, with uh, the, the experts, people who've spent their careers on this, and we've been learning a great deal. And, and we've been working with them. I know perhaps Skyler, I can't pronounce it. Yeah, yeah, it's tough. Um, you might want to comment, but it ends <laughs> a lot of it in perception. I mean, I, I looked at the television this morning, I was watching. Channel 25 out of Boston, and in their ads, they frequently use two M13 people locked up with all those tattoos and all that. Frankly, that's fairly scary. If I walked into those guys in the, you know, in a dark alley, I'd be fearful. So a lot of it's our perception, is it not? Well, I think a lot of it is that if you so have, if I'm perceiving that as a danger, you know. And I'm, you know, and I'm Donald Trump. Certainly, you're using. You know, he mentions that group all the time. Come M13 coming up from Guatemala, and you know, whatever. So I'm mentioning that all the time. Then I, then I see that on the television, and I say, Oh my God, they're here. And uh, now I'm, I'm worried. So you know, it's like when I first opened the program down in Bennington for delinquent kids. You know, and people would come down the street and I'd watch them walk to the other side of the street as they went by the building. There was no danger, but they perceived the danger. And I, I think that's a lot of what's happening here, is people perceiving a danger. Well, and I think that is part, if you have something that's on television, it carries with some individuals an air of legitimacy that it, and some authoritative speaking. I think that's related to the bully pulpit problem that we have. It's both uh, a problem and a solution depending upon what the, what the speech is. Uh, I teach the hate crimes class at the Vermont Police Academy and uh, when I first began teaching we would watch portions of a documentary called The Letter which, relate, which related to an incident that occurred in a city in Maine in which there had been an influx of refugees from northern Africa following the genocide. And uh, the mayor of the city had written an open letter to the elders, as he put it, saying, stop sending your people to our city. Our, our resources are strained. Uh, and then, as the documentary, documentary portrays it, he 
went on vacation for some period of time. And in the wake of that, uh, without, um, without much delay, there started to be hate crimes, uh, acts of vandalism uh, that occurred. And as the documentary presented it, uh, a white supremacist group from the Midwest learning about this letter, this is back before the days of social media, drove all the way to Maine to get a, a, a permit to march down the center of town. Um, so that's what I'm talking about when you permission structure where someone is saying something that may open the door um, to otherwise what most people consider to be deeply socially unacceptable behaviors or expressions of, of intolerance. Um, and I think that uh, is challenging. You can't criminalize a letter to the editor. Um, but what the community did there and what the governor of Maine did there was organize peaceful counter protests to demonstrate that um, this was that what they were proposing, which is that this town would be op opposed to people of color or people of the Muslim faith, was unthinkable in their community. Um, but they, these are this is part of the, the complexity and the challenge. I think uh, that's why we work, we work as hard as we can with community groups um, who have you know the ears to the ground better than we do, and more solutions. Go ahead. It, it, you know, yeah, and I'm sorry. It's, it's, it, we don't usually do this, but go ahead. You're dying to. Yeah, to and I'm correct. sorry. I'm so obvious in my face of, with that. I appreciate. I appreciate all of that, and I, and I hear so much the um, the overextension of law enforcement can feed very much into, right? Just as just as he's saying, absolutely. Um, I think it also feeds in the other way, and, and and so yes, absolutely. Like there, are, it's a multi pronged thing we have to attack on many. Facets, but I, I know that, like um, in the Bennington situation, um, that you know, my understanding in talking with some folks, and I and I did go to college on criminology stuff, although I'm not a criminologist. Simple assault does not take physical contact to be charged with, and the fact that uh, Mitch is that his last name showed up at the um, the 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 press conference talking about it, you know, you, it could be seen that there are chargeable offenses. And, and, and so my only, point, my only point about that is to say that there is also license in that. In a quick, uh, in our little town, a kid who was, who was expressing hateful things and he had a Confederate flag on his, his car, he got pulled over and was not given a ticket. It happens to people all the time. But in his conversation to me, he understood it in his head as being a, 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 an agreement, a tacit agreement by the law enforcement person with his ideas. Now, that's not an arrestable offense, but it just speaks to that. Well, I, you know, I would speak to the Bennington case, and, and I was there at the press conference, as was Julio. And I would say that life would have been a lot simpler if people hadn't reacted to him and just ignored him. Um, he wouldn't have gotten what he wanted, but what he got was a headline saying he was there. And it took away from the effort. So I, I think in some cases, you may be better off not to react to someone. Um, he, uh, he walked in and all of a sudden people in the audience began to react to him, not to people that were speaking at the press conference. I absolutely respect and that. I, and I, so from my perspective, yeah. sometimes no reaction is better than that type of reaction. But we we'll debate that for totally. a And we also know from watching him that the fact that he was not arrested they've used as propaganda material to say, yeah. this is how you can run right. people of color out of office. <clears throat> and, and so it, it's all every side. I don't mean to say it's not no, that I case. It's just, thank you, and no, I'm sorry. I, I was there, and I, I, I still wonder what would happen if we just ignored it. I mean, I, we, were at a, we were at a public hearing on firearms. I ignored people doing a certain thing as chair of the committee. The House chose to not ignore that and got a much different reaction than we did. Um, I, I, that's all I will say. To Ooh, some, no, please finish. I guess just to conclude, I, I, I can't uh, underscore enough the importance of the community response uh, in partnership with law enforcement because there are, like I said, there are definite limits to government power. Um, and. It is community leadership that in our educational system, and there's been legislation, important legislation passed in this body this year that um, 
I think has a longer a longer term effect in terms of changing hearts and minds, exposing people to other viewpoints. Um, and uh, as I've testified in earlier sessions on, on legislation here, uh, we have been developing, uh, uh, as we go along, this bias incident reporting system where we, we've encouraged and we have a commitment from the Criminal Justice Training Council and, and the member agencies that law enforcement report to us things that the biased incidents, whether they be anti-Semitic, homophobic, uh, racist, that even if it may not be a prosecutable offense to notify their state's attorney, because it may be that those items are either precursors to, uh, to acts of violence or criminality, or will allow law enforcement authorities to connect the dots, or in another case where there might be an assault, to be able to show that there's a bias element for that defendant. And a vital picture, a vital portion of that is for cases where there, where there won't be a, a criminal or law enforcement response to then close the loop with their community groups and, and support their efforts to speak out against that and to do that in a way that's lawful, effective, and, and, and from their, uh, uh, and that meets their, their goals in terms of publicity and participation. So I'm open to any other questions. Any other questions? Uh, very helpful. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. I don't know how long. I was going to hopefully, it seems like we've covered a lot of it. So. Yeah. Um, but it would be helpful to have the Vermont State Police perspective on dealing with this um, task. So, for the record, Captain Gary Scott from Vermont. <laughs> 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 no, he got just promoted. That's just last week, so. Uh, yeah. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Director of Fair and Impartial Policing for the Vermont State Police. Um, so I guess uh, um, we're I guess we're thinking about how the agency is changing. A lot of things we're talking about here today that you know, Julio brought up, and how we're looking at hate incidents and the bias. And we've already started that process, uh, but we're in the of reporting it. So when something an incident like that occurs, the AG's office is aware. Um, the local state's attorney's office is brought into that loop. We still have a ways to go to make sure the sort of the, uh, the boots on the ground understand what the, the mission is and how we capture those incidents. So the, the image is put on the park bench. We don't necessarily have a, a known victim in that case. It may and has been coded as just a vandalism. And so making sure that the officers understand that that code needs to have that bias code added to it. So we'll have vandalism and the bias code uh, entered in there. So that's a process we are in right now. Um, and a lot of times that when that happens, if it goes up on a private building, say a, a restaurant, an image goes up, the restaurant a lot of times isn't the reporter of that, of that incident. It's a community member. If they drive by, they see it, it's offensive to them, they make the call to the police. The restaurant sends a worker out there, they, you know, they power wash it off, and they're not really involved in this process. So that creates these complexities sometimes of when we're investigating these incidents and where they can and cannot go, but that's what we're in the process of right now. Regardless, that incident it's on the on the restaurant should be coded out. So at the end of the year, we have a scope of idea. Is our awareness that our Vermont State Police and other law enforcement agencies in the state has the awareness gotten better, or have we had a huge increase in hate? I think I'll reiterate what, what, what Julio said, is we don't really know the scope of the problem. I think, as you've mentioned many times, if social media brings these things up a little bit more, but I don't know about the actual numbers, and we're trying to really drill down to see what that is. It's, and I don't think we'll be there this year or next year. It's going to be more about that upfront education of understanding where these incidents are occurring, making sure we put them in, we document them at the end of the year we have code. But I think we're seeing a lot more... Um, you know, publicity around individual acts that occur. I think what, what I also don't want to forget is there's another group that has been the target many times in Vermont, that's the lower socioeconomic group, whether or not they be or not. My time dealing with those with folks um, has been that, that that group is also a target. So we take those incidents in. We do work in collaboration with federal partners, the FBI, Joint Terrorism Task Force, the JTTF, 
is aware of every incident that occurs, that re recording goes to them. Uh, and then also the Vermont Information Center. So every incident is funneled and co recorded in those ways. And then at the end of the year, also through the, the Spillman and the Valcor systems, we're hoping to get a better scope of problem that can be reported out through the VCIC. And I, I do appreciate everything that uh, Vermont State Police are trying to do. Uh, but we have a disjointed system with 14 different state attorneys, 14 different um, courts, criminal courts anyway, and we also have a uh, wide grid of, of local law enforcement, so it becomes difficult to have a, a uniform consistency of investigations is something we're trying to tackle. Consistency of um, the behaviors, but I, um, I think maybe part of the answer lies in what Thank you. <laughs> um, and then I'm, I'm horrible at names. That's why when we do a public hearing, I always call on somebody else to list the names. Um, but uh, you know, trying to mix a Boston accent in with the hard to pronounce name. I, you know what he's doing in the schools, what Skyler's doing at the University of Vermont. Those things eventually are the solution. Uh, I, you know, I, we still have discrimination, we still have incidents of hate, we still have, and it may be in fact be growing because both the internet and the, and the current president of the United States continuing to use the framing debates in that term of the words of groups. You know, I've been to Guatemala, I've been to Costa Rica, I've been to Nicaragua, I didn't get off the ship, but that was a different reason. Um, you know, so I've been to many of those countries, and I don't see those people the same as he evidently does. Uh, people that from them come those countries, but it seems like um, the education is the key. I, I don't think it changes without that. And what you said earlier, the community outreach, and we're continuing trying to partner up with that around the state. As many of you are aware of the efforts we've done, but it's a it's a chipping away process. We're not there all the way. Senator Roy. So <clears throat> I think that <clears throat> um, I took away a couple different things here, but one of them, when I was thinking about um, in Brattleboro, we had a, I don't even remember the, the, what the poster actually looked like. It was a poster that came from a, a, a hate group. Some, it was a horrible thing. It was, um, a, do, you, do you remember, Julio, what it, <clears throat> it was this poster that came from a group outside that was had found a few people in town that were sympathetic and put these posters all over town. And the community response was to get use it as an opportunity to do an education in every school, in the public, every um, development of the pub public housing, every project, every um, they just did a whole thing and. It stopped. Now, it may have just gone underground, but it wasn't, it didn't continue. But the other thing that I really took away from this is that um, <clears throat> two things. We need, to, we need to continue to listen to people of color in our communities because we have, we have um, organizations that are very concerned about this in our communities. They have very few people of color in those organizations. And, and so, um, in one that I've been at, suddenly somebody said, <clears throat> some member who was a person of color in that group said, you know, we talk a lot here about talking about these things, but we don't really talk about them. We talk about talking about them, but even our group hasn't confronted this. And the other thing I really took away was that we need to, those kids who are vulnerable to, to the recruiting and to the, um, there, it's based on fear, and we need to, we need to, and that, if you remember when the, when we were um, dealing with the school shootings, and the kid, the one of the pages sat there and said, what we need to do in school, he was a 13-year-old page, and he said, what we need to do in school is we need to make sure that those kids who are, are marginalized in school, that we, we don't continue to marginalize them because those are the kids that react. 
And I thought that was incredibly mature of him to, to say that. So I, I just, I didn't. Um, so anyway, thank you. Yes, this is. Well, thank you, uh, yeah. uh, Captain. <coughs> Captain. 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 Thank you. A few weeks. A few weeks. Please stay in college. Sorry. Uh, yep. I have to just call him Gary. I want to I want to, Gary's good enough. I want to thank everybody nice. for being here this morning. That's great. Yeah. Yeah. It's been enlightening, and I'm sure that uh, it doesn't end here. It really begins here, and I continue a conversation about this problem in Vermont. We don't have simple solutions, but we, I'm reminded that by some of the comments here today, we also have the, uh, the swastikas, which are particularly religious groups. We have the Ku Klux Klan. We have all of that growing here, but there is only when I went on the Southern Poverty Law Center's website and I asked Peggy to make copies of some stuff that is on there, and if you want to go to that, there's some good information there. Vermont has one group and um, one hate group right now that's recognized by the Southern Poverty Law Foundation, and that's the, I can't think of the name of it. Patriot Front. Huh? The Patriot Front. The Patriot Front. And we've seen some of that. Um, literature and so forth. So uh, well, luckily we're, you know, we have, they, oh. but they are keeping an eye on it. And, that, and that's helpful. And there's a, lot, there's a wealth of information about the subject on their website. Uh, we couldn't get anybody from there to speak this morning because of, well, who knows why, but. Um, Patriot Front is the one that had the, the things in Brattleboro. In Brattleboro, yeah. yeah. yeah the most recent ones up in Burlington. Okay. And thank you all, and thank you for helping us to understand what's going on in other parts of the state, which haven't, um, yeah. we haven't seen the public. So, we're going to take a break to quarter of them, okay, thank and you. then we come back to talk about that. So why don't we start, David Schur from the Attorney General's office is going to walk us through the bill and let us know if the Attorney General supports it or not. Thank you, Senator, and I'll start wearing the uh, legislative walkthrough hat and then switch to the Attorney General representative hat. And just for the record, Assistant Attorney General David Chair, representing the Attorney General's office. Um, so this is a uh, bill that was worked out between a number of stakeholders, um, starting on page one of the draft as passed by the House, which I think the committee has in front of it, hopefully. Um, 518? 518, yeah. Do you have a folder? Yeah. Did I put it over? Yeah, it was, it was right there. I put it off to the side. I was, your stuff to the Page 518, actually in the fire and park, the police and path by the house. We're taking up the house path first. Oh, no, that's hate crimes. I mean, is it one that we have already? No, it's a brand new one. Okay, wait, I have to put that stuff over there to get it out of the way. Okay. Yeah, it should be the second folder that was left on the desk. Sorry. So I'll uh, keep, should I keep run, running through? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. okay. So on page one, uh, one of the primary changes is the end of the first paragraph, subsection A1. Um, the underline is the new addition. What this accomplishes, what this addition accomplishes, is basically saying that individual agencies around the state, if they want to, can be um, more protective of immigrant rights or rights of uh, undocumented individuals. Um, and I should, when I say, rights of undocumented individuals, I really mean information about undocumented individuals. They can be more protective of that information if they choose, um, and they may not be less protective of that information. Uh, it's important to note that, it, and the purpose of this is to make it clear that the model policy is setting a floor of protection, but it doesn't set a ceiling of protection. Uh, it was the ACLU's position that the law already essentially did that. It was the Attorney General's office's position that the prior law essentially was saying that every policy has to have the same 
legal effect. Uh, and we believe that was the, the, the language as it stood prior to this amendment was simply saying all the components have to be the same. You can adopt additional components if you want, uh, but you can't do anything that would contradict the model policy. Um, David, can I ask you a question? <clears throat> but when you say that it had to have all of the policies, it didn't have to have the exact same words. That's exactly right. Okay. And that was uh, the legislative compromise that came through in 2017. There had been a debate about whether all the policies should be exactly the same or whether agencies should have a little flexibility. And uh, the legislature came down on the side of allowing some flexibility. Thank you. Uh, but that then left it to the, the, um, the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council in consultation with our office to figure out if, in fact, the various policies sufficiently matched the model policy, and that was the work that we've been doing. Um, and what this does is make it explicitly clear that uh, this is a floor, not a ceiling, and people can go above it. I do want to note for the committee that it remains the law, uh, uh, as passed by Act 54 in 2017, that no policies are allowed to violate federal law, and they name those federal laws in that section of the statute. Uh, that part of the law is not being changed. It's not in this bill you have in front of you because it's not being amended. So that will remain the policy. Or sorry, that will remain the law. Um, on page two of the bill, uh, the top of that bill um, basically is a, I would describe it more as an administrative change, talking about deadlines for when um, updated policies have to be implemented and when the check on updated policies have to, has to be completed. That's what that is. Uh, moving down to subsection B on page two, uh, we've got language that basically says, um, we, we said comply with subdivision A1 of this section. All that accomplishes is um, making clear that the floor, not a ceiling policy applies here as it did in subsection A. It's really just getting the language to match. Um, and then we added in consultation with the Office of the Attorney General, which is basically just putting into law what the practice has been for the last few years. Uh, and the same um, changes that I just discussed are enacted uh, in the three following changes. The final line on page two is actually an important one, even though it's brief. And it basically accomplishes two goals. Uh, one is, well, I'd say from the Attorney General's Office's standpoint, it accomplishes one very important goal, which is to say that our office will no longer be in the position of making uh, statements about the compliance of individual agencies, municipal agencies, with federal law. We actually view that as a something that is protective for the state. Um, towns are their own legal entity. They carry their own, um, they, they will make their own decisions as to legal risk. And we think it's important for us to be out of the business of making judgments about what an individual town agency um, may or may not do. I will note, though, the town agencies are still subject to the state law that says you will be in compliance with federal law. They are, of course, bound by federal law as well. Can you um, give me a real life example? Sure. So, one example of, of this is there was a debate in the, among the stakeholders when we were designing the model policy. Uh, at the end of 2017 regarding what information could be told to a judge regarding uh, the status, uh, I should say the citizenship or immigration status of an individual who may have been arrested. Now, when somebody's asking for bail, they, uh, when an officer, I should say, is asking a judge to set bail, what they're asking about, what they're asking for is some protection to make sure that that person will uh, appear and will not flee from prosecution. The debate was whether 
the officer should be allowed to say to the judge, and note here that we're talking all about state officials, this is not dealing with communications with federal officials, um, whether the officer could say to the judge anything at all about the individual's immigration status. It was the position of advocates, uh, migrant justice and ACLU in particular, that, that um, they should not be allowed to say anything and their position was that that could unduly and unfairly and unnecessarily prejudice the judge towards holding the person. Law enforcement felt differently about it and felt that there are circumstances where it is important in order to give the full picture of what's happening in a particular case. It's important and necessary to be able to tell the judge something about somebody's immigration status. An example for that might be Let's say you have an exchange student at one of our colleges in Vermont, exchange student from France, say. Um, that student is accused of a serious crime on campus, um, or off campus, but is accused of a serious crime, crime of violence. Uh, and it's near the end of the semester. The student might be due to fly home soon. It would be the concern of law enforcement that it would be very hard to describe to the judge why they are so concerned about flight from prosecution for that particular individual if they couldn't state that the person is not a citizen and that they may have a visa that's due to expire in weeks or less. Um, and obviously that's a very particular example, but you could imagine other such examples where somebody may be running to the end of uh, their legal status in the country and may be going home and there is a very serious public safety need that the state has to accomplish in order to um, effectuate their job. So law enforcement felt that it was important to be able to state that in order to sort of bridge the, as best we could, bridge the divide, although the ACLU of Migrant Justice didn't ultimately agree with this language, but in order to address their concerns as best we could, if you look at the model policy under that bail provision, it does say that, that, shall, that considerations of, uh, that st of immigration status or citizenship will not be a sole reason to hold somebody. It's just one of a number of considerations if it's relevant. So we tried to sort of give that explicit direction to officers. Look, this isn't a reason to ask for bail by itself, but if it is part of the full picture of what's going on in order to protect public safety and make sure that the state can protect victims, you can talk about it. So that's, an, that's a concrete example. This is what the House passed. This language that you're looking at is yes. what the House passed. What I was just describing is the model policy, which yeah. was developed, but, which hasn't but, been passed by the legislature, okay. but, but was. But, but, but model policy, we're following a model policy that hasn't been passed by the legislature. That's right. The legislature directed the Vermont Criminal yes. Justice Training Council to come up with it. And so it's not a legislatively um, enacted Document. Thank you, David, for that explanation. So that was long-winded, but it, it goes to show. Well, it goes to the heart of the issue that um, is being debated here, I guess. But we'll hear more testimony on it that we go through. So I, I just want to make sure on this last line here, what this last line is saying is that if a municipality or whatever agency decides to go above the model policy, that the AG's office will no longer be issuing statements of uh, acceptance or, I mean, that you're not, you're not going to weigh in on um, municipal policies. We will still weigh in on municipal, municipal policies to the extent laid out in subsection A1 and right. page one. Just to say, you know, did you do the minimum yes. um, or more? But However, we're not going to weigh in on this particular language in state law regarding uh, are you in um, compliance with 1373 or 1644 for municipal agencies. Now, okay. I will be very clear that in our role as a member of the Criminal Justice Training Council and as a sort of legislatively um, directed uh, part of the process of developing model policies, we will always follow the applicable laws for those policies. So we will not be working um, to develop model policies that violate federal law. We view it as 
the plain obligation of uh, government officials to follow the relevant law, and to do otherwise would be um, uh, set a very dangerous precedent. Um, and uh, I will also say, as the committee may know, we've, the Attorney General's office does believe that 1344 and uh, 1373 and 1644, the relevant uh, federal statutes, are not constitutional. We have filed briefs, uh, amicus briefs, in a number of cases arguing that they are not constitutional. Um, and we hope to see them overturned by the courts. That being said, they remain the law today, and it is therefore our obligation to follow the law as it stands, and we will continue to do that as in our role directing statewide policies. Um, but with regard to municipal agencies, we'll say, look, you gotta hit the floor, you can go above, but we out, it's not our job to make the risk decisions that's on yeah. you now to make the risk decisions with regard to how close so you tell the law. So the city wants to go well beyond what the model policy is they're welcome to do so but you're not going to criticize or advise them we won't yeah as long as they're yeah exactly it will say look you you make your own risk assessments about how close you're going to push this um we also again we view this as something that is protective for the statewide entities that we're trying to uh, be in compliance with Sorry, to put on two hats here as your subject for Brent Harrow had to go upstairs for something in the house. So um, if you're when you finish the walkthrough, you're welcome to give us the attorney general's position on the bill. Thank you. And I think it might be hard to distinguish. Right. I think I've already been edging over into that role. But uh, the I just say the final piece that I haven't mentioned is again purely an administrative piece on page three. Re um, uh, stating a new deadline for when all this stuff will be done. Again, that's not particularly substantive, just a matter of when will all this happen. Um, so I've given you all, so now I'm gonna put on the Attorney General's hat officially. Um, and I've given you an overview. I've already actually given you a, a bunch of the policy reasons why we support this. Uh, I will also say that this is, as it passed the House, this bill is supported by the Attorney General's Office, by Migrant Justice, by ACLU, and by the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. It is, I will note for the committee, very rare to have agreement among those four entities on anything. Um, so we viewed this as an important step forward. Uh, we view it as an important step forward both to enact the policy goal of protecting everybody in the state of Vermont. The Attorney General feels very strongly about that. He also as I've already mentioned, does feel strongly uh, and, and believes it is our simple legal obligation to follow the law. Uh, but we want to give towns the flexibility to be as protective as they want to be. The bail example that I mentioned is an important one and I think a good illustration of where town, essentially that was a debate about what does public safety require. A town may say, we believe that uh, it is more important to withhold that information about uh, immigration citizenship status, and that's where we're going to make that decision on public safety. That doesn't actually implicate federal law at all, um, but it's allowing the town to say we're going to weigh the public safety concerns and the um, uh, immigrant right concerns a little bit differently than the state did, and that's fine. We're now saying go ahead and do that. Uh, it's not our. It's no longer our job to, uh, it, you know, to prevent you from making that decision. Uh, we also think that. As I said, this is useful because uh, it will um, get the state, when, you know, when we're in these disputes with the federal government, it gets the state out of the business of having to make representations about anything other than the statewide policies that we have been a part of. Let me ask you a question. Can there be a difference depending upon the crime that the person is being charged with? So I'll give you two examples. One, aggravated sexual assault. Two, driving with license suspended or without a license. What, is there allowed in here a different response depending upon the criminal activity? Yes, I think that there's nothing in, I would argue there's nothing in this law or in the model policy that, that prevents law enforcement from making all of the usual yeah. differentiations yeah, that I, they might as make. As a citizen of the state, I'd be more concerned that somebody who is alleged to have been charged with aggravated sexual assault would be released than I would if somebody who's charged with driving without a license is released or 
normally that would just be diverted. Right. So I, I, I worry that we don't give the flexibility for the, you know, as long as it's a model. And the model policy did come down on the side. I'm going to take your example of the student from France. Mm -hmm. So the model policy did come down on the side of giving law enforcement the flexibility to make decisions about what needs to be said in order to protect safety, you know, risk of flight. Um, and again, all the normal <coughs> tools that are available to law enforcement with regards to, um, you know, pretrial safety, whether that's detention or conditions or whatever it might be, are still going to be available. Um, that aren't, they aren't directly affected either by the model policy or by this law. You can also, as you know, Senator, hold somebody without bail for violent felonies. That's still available. Um, so all that stuff I don't think is going to be significantly impacted um, by this law or the model policy. So, so the, the floor is the floor and then the model policy allows you. Or this statute will allow for allow you to go beyond going beyond who, who just the only thing that scares me is you'll have two different systems of justice depending upon where you live. And again, I mean, I think the legislature did just well, I'd say a couple things that one, the, the model policy is pretty comprehensive in terms of what it requires and what it prevents. I don't think that these, that the differences you're going to see, um, I'd say lawful differences that you're going to see uh, are going to have a huge practical difference. There's already everybody in the state is going to be prohibited from asking about immigration or citizenship status of anybody unless it's specifically necessary to the investigation, for example, a human trafficking investigation, unless it's uh, necessary to establish the crime. So I think the model policy is going to set up, it sets a very high floor, I would say, uh, which will protect safety and also um, protect the rights of undocumented individuals or immigrant individuals um, quite extensively. And so we don't view these differences as having a large practical effect, yeah, although I think it might be, you know, the water. Um, you know, I think um, you'll hear a different opinions on what the difference <laughs> be from advocates. I, I just, I just, you know, I need to understand the bill myself and be clear about it. So I just want to make sure that the other thing I want to make sure of, have we, are we in danger once again of, of losing federal funds? That, yes, yeah, so that's a good question. That brings me to um, Vermont State Police are going to have a different <laughs> viewpoint on this, on this bill. Uh, we, it is, it is the Attorney General's office's belief that these changes will not endanger federal funds to the state. It may be the case that individual towns could make decisions about their own policies that could place them in a course of conflict with uh, the federal government. Um, that will be the responsibility of individual towns to make that decision. But would the federal government be so willing to recognize the distinction between a town and the state? In other words, let's say we have 10 states that adopt policies that go beyond the floor. 10 towns. I'm sorry? 10 towns. 10 towns. Um, would the federal government deal with all of them individually, or would it say Vermont as a state is preventing uh, proper compliance? Uh, a couple things. One is um, most, but not all, of the, of the grants that happen are directly to municipalities. So the relationship there is um, municipal government to federal okay. government. So they would be dealing directly with the towns. Where the issue comes into play is in the occasional times where, um, as part of a statewide grant, there are occasionally subgrantees that are named in it. What we've been seeing, though, is even with the current, and, and well, so I'll state my piece, and then I do want to acknowledge VSB as a different uh, reading on this, but what we have seen as a matter of reality, even with the current Department of Justice, which we believe has taken a very maximal position in terms of um, trying to prevent state flexibility on this, they have explicitly exempted um, the Attorney General and the Governor from having to make representations about whether the subgrantee is um, is in compliance. 
So they have said, look, you're making representations to your own compliance. You are not required to make representations as the town's compliance. My understanding is that Vermont State Police uh, and the commissioner do have concerns about that, uh, and they will testify to those concerns. They believe that the subgrantee issue could potentially place statewide grants in jeopardy. We don't agree with that position. We feel otherwise, and we feel that the documentation that we've been receiving from the federal government uh, demonstrates otherwise. Mm -hmm. Other questions for David? If I might, I just had two other issues that I wanted to address. I'm, I'm almost there. Um, the Human Rights Commission has submitted written testimony. Yeah, I, we're trying to schedule them yeah. next week, and that with, but now we may have to change. We need to be able to find room 10 or 11 for Ethan Allen for the next meeting. We need a room with more room. So, you know, but we're trying to schedule them for the 17th. Uh, that's our plan is for next Wednesday to take this bill up again, but it'll depend on where there is a room available for us to be, and obviously there's not enough room. So the Human Rights yeah, Commission just, did send, yes, right. did just, send a letter. She's not able to be here today, but we want to whenever she's available. And it sounds like we'll she's get into that. next Wednesday at 1045, so hopefully okay. we'll find her. It sounds like we'll get into that in greater detail then next yeah. week. I yeah. will just forecast for the committee that our office doesn't have an objection to what are essentially increased enforcement mechanisms, which is what the Human Rights Commission is asking for. But we would note for the committee that there will be uh, increased opposition to that from law enforcement agencies. We would be likely to lose the support of the Criminal Justice Training Council, although I don't know that for sure, nor do I think that, you know, that would have to go through the council to decide. Can, can, can we wait on that issue until we actually hear what the suggestion yeah, is sure. from the Rights Commission? Because I have no idea what happy that is. Happy to wait. Yeah. Happy Before to wait. we decide how the right. group so, might feel about it, <laughs> we should just and, and figure out what it is that they're responding yeah. to, yeah. Right. since we don't Fair even normal. know that yet. Um, I appreciate your trying to... I'm just trying to front load everything here. Yeah, don't. Uh, okay. <laughs> Our little pea brains can't uh, we, it. we will allow you to come back. I appreciate that. We're not going to keep you from speaking. Um, but so, the, yeah, that, I, that then I'll, I'll, I'll leave that uh, as it is. I, I would, oh, one other piece, I think um, there has been concern about the consistency issue, and that may be raised again. Again, we do think that as a practical matter for people on the ground dealing with law enforcement, they aren't going to feel significant differences in those interactions because those interactions are uh, pretty heavily regulated by the model policy. And somebody going beyond the model policy is mostly going to be dealing with um, interagency communication between federal and state. And that's not something that um, the sort of average person interacting with the officers are necessarily going to feel a difference on. Although, again, the advocates feel very strongly that um, there should be some pretty strict limits on that. And I would note that the model policy, it is our belief that the model policy does actually have quite strict limits on that. So I would just conclude by saying we support it. Uh, H518 is passed by the House. We think it accomplishes several very important things uh, and strikes a good compromise between the various parties. Okay. Thank you. Um, Thank you. Our next witness is Cap uh, Gary Scott mm -hmm. <coughs> of the Vermont State Police. Thank you again, Captain Gary Scott of the Vermont State Police. And I, I, I want to echo what David exactly said. Is our concern is the JAG funding as we've gone through it <clears throat> for the past couple of years now with the grant, with the policy, and how they interpret it. So the commissioner and our legal counsel say that there's there's concerns there of what the Department of Justice could do, looking at. Mm -hmm. I mean, just briefly explain the JAG. That's op opiate, essentially a lot of opiate uh, um, uh, opiate officers. Well, Southern and Northern Drug, Drug Task, Task Force, Force, and there's some community interdiction. and there's some community grants out there the for community grants that provide local law enforcement with the ability to yeah. deal with that problem. Yeah, it's about two million dollars ish. So that is the that is a concern for the commissioner of what Department of Justice reaction would be, and I, and we appreciate exactly what the Attorney General's office is saying that 
it's, there's been a path there, but I guess we're a little gun shy for the last, two, you know, of having that money held up and not knowing. It's very unpredictable what they're doing there. So that is a, a, a significant concern of, for us of what could happen if a town is a subgrantee. Could they hold all the money? And we are in the midst of an opiate crisis. Uh, I understand that concern, and as a member of the appropriations, yeah, I'm so concerned about it. But I will say there are certain times when you know you have to. <coughs> take a position that might not agree with the grantors and we suffered um, shortages from the burn grant because of our refusal to put teenagers on the sex offender registry who were treated as juveniles in our family court. So I mean, the state chose to take the 15% cut in the burn grant. I don't know. Um, this, like 10 years ago, I was chair of this committee of me made a choice, a, a real choice that we knew the feds would not provide us with the full funding for the grants, but we said, it's just not right. Somebody was allowed to be in family court as a sex offender <coughs> to put their name on the sex offender registry when you violating anything that we believe in. So I, you know, I appreciate that, but there are times when you can't allow federal So, you know how I feel about um, uh, the Vermont State Police contracting. Mm -hmm. So, but given that right now you do contract, so could a town like um, Waterbury decide that <coughs> they are going to uh, go above the floor here with a contract with you, so you are in the position of following their policy. Would a town without a police department be allowed to, who contracts with somebody else, would they be allowed to to um, have a different policy? Or is it the agency itself that has the policy? My understanding would be the agency, and we would follow okay. our agency you, policy regardless. So if we go into, okay. so if a town does adopt a higher standard, the state police, as we go all over the entire state, and that could create confusion, I think, that okay. that could be an issue. So, you know, I think about coming off the interstate, you're going after a speeder, and then you're now you're in the town, and you make that arrest. Right. That town has adopted this policy, the state police has this policy, and now the arrest is made in that town. Uh, that can create sort of public backlash of why the police, why the state police in this town and all these things could sort of go along with that. But that, that's that's some of the concerns, absolutely. But a town without a police department shouldn't even have a policy, right? Because it's the agency that has the The agency policy. has it, but the town could start to go down that path, absolutely. Through and their have their own policy without, without having a... Yeah, so that uh, would be a conversation okay. that we, would happen that locally. We'll take, we'll take that up in our other bill. Yeah. <laughs> I think you should take that up in your... <laughs> we will. I'm making a list of things. <laughs> <laughs> this has become confusing enough. You're out of town without a police force that's setting a policy that the mm -hmm. whoever the police force is that's yeah. covering them. And it right. could be the sheriff, for example. And it could be right. multiple in some cases. It could be, yeah. Um, yeah. Anyway. Uh, other questions for the mm -hmm. Kevin? Um, Captain, thank you very much. Thanks. Stay tuned. All right. Thanks for staying um, around. Our next witness is Will Lambert from uh, Migrant Justice, and Will is going to um, act as an interpreter for. Chairman Sears and uh, members of the committee, uh, uh, for the record, Will Lambeck, uh, I'll primarily be interpreting for Enrique Balcazar. I might have some uh, additional comments at the end. And then also, um, uh, just for the committee's record, there's a list of folks who uh, are outside now who wanted to be in, but for space limitations. Well, we apologize that we were not aware that we were going to have this crowd. And I apologize to anybody who's stuck outside, but 
not a problem at all. But if, if the committee would like it for the record, we, we, that'd be fine if you want to hand that. We can accept the record. But next week, I'm sure you'll take up the bill. We'll have more room. Thank you, Member Senator. Go ahead. Sí. Hola a todos. Este, mi nombre es Enrique Balcázar. Estoy aquí en nombre de la, representando a la comunidad eh, de trabajadores lecheros, trabajadores migrantes en el estado de Vermont. Hello everybody, my name is Enrique Balcázar. I'm here representing the community of immigrant dairy workers in Vermont. Y estoy aquí apoyando el proyecto eh, de ley eh, 528. Y bueno, también mencionar, aunque no se hablará de esto, la enmienda presentada eh, por la Comisión de Derechos Humanos. And I'm here today supporting Bill 518, uh, H518, uh, as well as, and I understand we aren't going to be talking about it today, but as well as the amendment that was presented by the Human Rights Commission. Sí. Y bueno, un poco de contexto que quiero compartir eh, es que por décadas la comunidad migrante Eh, en el estado de Vermont y también alrededor del país eh, sufrimos eh, la presión política de inmigración, estas políticas que separan familias, que, que no nos dejan vivir este, libres, ¿no? En donde queremos. And I want to start just by giving a little bit of context, which is that our community for decades, both in Vermont and around the country, have suffered from the political attacks by immigration agencies that don't allow us to live freely. Uh, eh, and separate us from our families. Aquí en el estado de Vermont, eh, nosotros nosotros hemos estado trabajando por muchos años en en la política de no más polimigra, eh, pero esta ha sido debilitada bajo el gobierno de del actual presidente Donald Trump y por la defensa de la policía eh, por mantener su relación con las agencias de inmigración. Uh, and we've been fighting for years uh, to address these issues through the fair and impartial policing policy, what we refer to in Spanish as la ley de no polimigra. Um, unfortunately, under the administration of Trump, uh, this policy has been weakened uh, because of threats from the presidential administration, as well as from the desire on the part of some law enforcement to maintain relationships of collaboration with federal immigration enforcement. Y bueno, esta esta colaboración, verdad, resulta termina en no fortalecer la confianza eh, total entre la policía y la comunidad migrante eh, en el estado de Vermont. And the existing collaboration between police agencies and federal authorities uh, makes it so that communities, immigrant communities, uh, cannot place their trust in uh, local and state police in the state. Eh, para mencionar algunos ejemplos, ¿verdad? Quiero mencionar el caso. Eh, ¿Quieres decir esta otra parte, la última parte atrás? Sí. Que esto termina en, en bueno, resulta en, en no crear confianza entre la policía y las comunidades migrantes en el estado de Vermont. And this results in trust not being created or built between immigrant communities and police agencies in the state of Vermont. Eh, bueno, un ejemplo de las consecuencias que quiero dar, eh, por ejemplo, eh, es el caso de Olman López, eh, un eh, compañero también trabajador lechero, que estuvo a punto de la deportación eh, en, en, el, con, en el condado de Addison, en el pueblo de Bergens. Eh, se, casi fue separado de su familia, él tiene tres hijos aquí, afortunadamente pudo eh, salir de detención. Eh, pero hubo colaboración entre la policía eh, con inmigración y, y esta es una preocupación en un caso que quería mencionar. And a recent example of this is the case of Olman López, a farm worker uh, from the county of uh, uh, Addison, town of Virgens, uh, who was separated from his family for months and was on the verge of being deported because of collaboration between police and immigration enforcement. The Virgins Police? Well, the police of Virgins? The police of Virgins? The state police. Eh, yo también eh, viví esto en carne propia cuando fui arrestado por agentes de ICE y pasé 11 días de mi vida encarcelado en, en un centro de detención eh, en mi... Bueno, I've also lived this in my own experience uh, when I was arrested by uh, ICE agents and spent 11 days behind bars in immigration detention. 
En mi caso eh, hubo colaboración eh, con el Departamento de Motores y Vehículos, que es una agencia del estado de Vermont eh, que proporcionó la información esencial eh, debido a que pues, yo saqué que aquí mismo en esta casa luchamos por el derecho humano a la movilización obteniendo la licencia y saqué mi licencia y esta agencia entregó mi información y también ha pasado en otros casos. Uh, and in this case, uh, ICE agents received uh, information from the Vermont Department of Motor Vehicles uh, state agency that provided them with the necessary information uh, to detain me. This is information that I had provided to the DMV because we had been here years ago to uh, uh, pass a law allowing the right to uh, access uh, driver's licenses, and I freely exercised my rights under that law. Uh, to obtain a license, and having given that information, uh, that was then passed on to ICE. Y bueno, esto eh, fue una campaña de ICE contra los líderes que demandamos el abuso de poder de estas agencias y la separación de familias. And the, my arrest was part of a campaign undertaken by ICE to arrest immigrant leaders who had been denouncing uh, unfair practices and the separation of families. El Departamento de Motores y Vehículos eh, del Estado de Vermont está cubierta bajo la política que hemos estado luchando eh, de no más polimigra, eh, que así lo llamamos nosotros, y esta es una de las consecuencias que les quería compartir. Uh, and the Vermont DMV is a state agency that is covered uh, under or is subject to uh, the fair and impartial policing policy, and so I just wanted to provide that example as well. Y bueno, quiero mencionar este, cuatro cosas que es lo que nos preocupa, ¿verdad?, de esto. La primera, eh, la política eh, modelo del Estado es, es débil, con algunos huecos donde permite que la policía colabore con las agencias de inmigración. No, I'd like to mention uh, uh, four uh, objections that we have to the current state of affairs as it uh, relates to fair and impartial policing. The first is that the model policy itself is weak and contains loopholes uh, which um, don't allow the policy to fully stop collaboration between local law enforcement and immigration authorities. Dos, esto no es implementado como debería ser, ¿verdad? Y hemos hemos estado investigando y hemos recibido 52 políticas del estado de Vermont y 13 de estas o lo que representa el 25% no cumple con el mínimo que requiere la política. The second issue is that even with that model policy, uh, or even that model policy is not being implemented as it should be. Uh, we've been requesting agencies fair and impartial policing policies. To date, we've received 52. We've received 52 policies from agencies around the state, and 13 of them are representing 25% of those agencies have not implemented the model policy and don't meet the minimum requirements of the policy. Tres, no hemos visto que el entrenamiento sea suficiente porque no hemos visto la evidencia clara de que esto está pasando, ¿verdad? Como que sea de una manera donde los policías están recibiendo entrenamiento de cómo actuar en cosas de inmigración. Uh, third, uh, we don't believe or we don't have evidence to believe that the trainings on fair and impartial policing have happened in a manner that's sufficient. Uh, we, we haven't seen evidence that police are receiving uh, sufficient training uh, on the responsibilities with regards to immigration enforcement. Y cuatro, pues, eh, las, ag las agencias eh, que han querido mejorar sus políticas para subirlas eh, más del mínimo Eh, han estado en duda si pueden o no pueden hacerlo y creo que mencionaron al, algo de esto acá. And the, the fourth issue finally is that uh, those agencies which have wanted to uh, change their policies to go above the minimum requirements have had the, the doubt about whether or not they will be allowed to do so. Y bueno, eh, hoy estamos aquí testificando a favor de este proyecto de ley eh, que permitirá y aclarará que las agencias pueden mejorar sus políticas. And so on that point, that's why today we're here testifying in favor of H-518, this bill, 
uh, because it will clarify to agencies that they uh, are able to uh, improve their policies above what's required in the model policy. Y bueno, eh, quiero mencionar que todavía quedamos preocupados por la política modelo que hay en el Estado y eh, queremos seguirla mejorando, ¿no? Porque es débil y les pedimos al comité que se involucre en la discusión eh, que, se va, que se abre eh, en el proceso de revisión eh, con el Consejo de Entrenamiento. Uh, and uh, with that, we, we continue to be concerned about the state of the model policy itself, uh, and we invite the committee uh, to be involved in the process of policy review uh, when that process begins within the Criminal Justice Training Council. Y por último, para cerrar, eh, nos gustaría estar presente la próxima semana eh, cuando esté presente la Comisión de Derechos Humanos eh, porque nos gustaría testificar a favor también de esta enmienda. And finally, we would like the opportunity to be present next week uh, when a subsequent hearing is called to hear testimony on the Human Rights Commission's amendment because we would like to testify in favor of that amendment. That's not a problem that I have questions. Questions. <laughs> Um, first question is, if this bill passes, uh, whatever form, if it's like what passed the House or with the Human Rights Commission amendment, would you feel comfortable in uh, reporting a crime to law enforcement or an unfair labor practice to authorities in Vermont? sentirías bien reportando esto a la policía de Vermont? Mm -hmm. eh, bueno, y quiero decir que bueno, los dos podemos contestar preguntas. Eh, Will está aquí traduciendo, pero también para, me puede ayudar con las preguntas para ahorrar tiempo también en la interpretación. Mm -hmm. Ajá. Y bueno, eh, eh, sí, nosotros en el pasado hemos eh, colaborado con la Comisión de Derechos Humanos eh, para trabajar en algunos casos donde, por ejemplo, un caso muy eh, viejo que fue el, eh, pero muy impactante para la comunidad que apoyó mucho a la comunidad fue el caso de Lorenzo donde el sheriff de, de Franklin eh, colaboró con agencias de inmigración pero a través del de apoyo de la comisión pudimos eh, ganar un caso ahí. Um, uh, Enrique had said that for questions uh, he may ha ask myself, Will, to respond as well to save time on, on interpreting. But for this question, uh, the response was, uh, well, in the past, uh, we, we have uh, felt comfortable bringing cases to the Human Rights Commission when there have been uh, abuses. For example, in the case of Lorenzo Alcudia, who was discriminated against by uh, originally the Franklin, corrected to Grand Isle Sheriff's Department, uh, the community did feel comfortable going to the Human Rights Commission uh, to present that case uh, of discrimination uh, against Mr. Acudia. Y, y por esto, bueno, eh, tenemos una relación con, con la Comisión eh, y como sería importante eh, por eso testificar a favor de esto, porque sería un, un de gran apoyo estándar. I may be missing something. <coughs> My question is about whether or not this bill passes. And if it were to pass, would it increase that trust? Would it increase that trust? Yeah. 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 Would it increase the trust? Yeah. 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 Mm -hmm. Sí, entonces, eh, sí, eh, claro que aumentaría, como dije en el pasado, tenemos buena relación. Esto, pues si se llega a pasar, eh, es algo que, que poco a poco eh, crearía más confianza en la comunidad y nos parece importante que esté dentro de este bill. Well, if, if this were to pass, I think little by little it, it would go towards uh, increasing trust uh, and, and that's one of the reasons we support this bill. Um, so just to add to that, and, and I think re, uh, related to the question, um, Enrique had mentioned the 13 policies that Migrant Justice has received from law enforcement agencies 
uh, that on our reading uh, don't meet the minimum requirements of the fair and impartial policing uh, statute and model policy. And uh, I'd like to uh, present those to the committee to put in the record if you're amenable. Um, and uh, for that's from you directly, Will. That's correct. These were emailed to a migrant justice volunteer who called every agency, uh, and the policies were emailed usually by the chief or the sheriff uh, and printed out to be presented here. Um, so uh, this for us is, is quite concerning, um, and I think we can come back to it more in the uh, uh, testimony around the Human Rights Commission's amendment, uh, but the fact that there have been multiple iterations of statute requiring departments to update their policies, uh, and we still have policies here that appear not to have been changed from 2011, 2014, uh, 2016, um, so, as to the question of trust, uh, to uh, second what Enrique said, um, this creates a framework for which trust can be built, um, but yeah, the, the test I, is I, if it will be implemented. But I just wanted to be, there's no point in doing any bill if it's not going to increase the trust uh, amongst say, the day, no folks who are in Enrique's position. <laughs> I mean, it, if there's a well, maybe you can um, talk to other colleagues of Enrique and find out what their thoughts are too. Yeah, I mean, it's bueno, lo importante aquí es que bueno, lo que recalcaba Will, verdad, como Eh, que, la que la policía está haciendo su trabajo y es por eso que bueno, la Comisión de Derechos Humanos es un, es un grupo importante para estar eh, dentro de, de esto y, y creo que eso es importante para nosotros, por eso estamos a favor. Uh, and just to interpret that, that, that uh, having the Human Rights Commission in, involved uh, in, in the process would, would go a long way towards increasing trust. Senator Mitkin and Senator Bruce. Um, you may have said this previously, but did you, of the policies received, were there, how many of those were meeting the fair and policy? I can respond to that, Senator. Um, so of the uh, 52 policies that were received, uh, 13 of them are 25%. Uh, on our reading did not uh, meet the minimum requirements. Uh, the rest of them, uh, 39, 75% uh, of them, uh, either uh, meet the, the minimum requirements because they've adopted the model policy verbatim uh, or have similar language that's materially similar. There are a couple of those that uh, on first reading, uh, we weren't entirely confident that they met the requirement, but they appear to. So uh, the first bill I ever passed in this building that I submitted and that the governor signed was the driver's privilege card bill. And we had a nice signing with Governor Shumlin out on the steps of the State House. Um, and it was a it was a celebration. But then I remember a couple of years ago hearing that ICE had distributed the information, or, or the DMV had distributed the information to ICE. And I took that very personally because we had had long discussions in passing the bill with the Department of Motor Vehicles, the governor's people, the chair of my committee, and myself. And Everybody was very clear that that information was never to go to immigration. So I, I understand the, uh, the skepticism, and I just want you to know that I, I think it's a good thing in light of that that we go back and look at the model policy and follow up on that as we look at passing this bill. Sí. Yes. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much, Senator. I got that. I know that. <laughs> <laughs>
Uh, Senator White, you had a question. Well, I'm, I'm just going looking through these. <clears throat> and I, I'm going to ask Peggy for copies so that I can read them because I've been really involved in this all along. But I, um, looking at one here, for example, that says, uh, no, the confidentiality portion is missing. But I know from working with some police departments that <clears throat> they have general policies that cover some of the things that are in the model policy. So they have a confidentiality policy that doesn't need to be specifically put in here because it's covered in their general policies for all of their um, all all of their um, work. So I I think. So would you just comment on that, that why, if, they, if their general policy covers something, why it would need to be in here specifically? Um, so thank you, Senator, for the question. And, uh, I'll respond to this as uh, myself rather than as an interpreter. Um, I, I believe maybe you're referring to Burlington Police Department's uh, policy. <coughs> I think it's Burlington that says confidential policy. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So they're they're a bit of a <coughs> unique case, um, uh, and uh, I think they're the only one that really falls within the category that you're referring to. Um, uh, we were involved in, in meetings with the Burlington City Council and uh, Police Department around the creation of this. I don't believe that there's a general confidential, confidentiality policy uh, in, uh, on the books in Burlington that fully covers the confidentiality provision in the model policy uh, that was removed. The path towards passing Burlington's policy was a little bit circuitous, and actually that policy predates the model policy in its current iteration. Uh, in most areas, it still meets the requirements, we believe, in uh, that one particular area it does not. Um, but I would say most of the policies you have in your hand, uh, they are deemed not to meet the minimum requirements because they are from a 2014 version or a 2016 version uh, where the policy has been substantively changed since then. Other questions? Thank you very much. We'll see you next week on uh, hopefully next week. Uh, if you want to respond after the, um, anybody who wants to speak next week, check with Peggy. But if you want to respond next week to the Human Rights Commission, and, and I imagine that a lot of people will. Muchas gracias por por el espacio y pues agradezco las palabras también. Thank you very much for the space. I appreciate Thanks. the words as well, and I hope this continues to move forward. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Rick, Rick got here. No, 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 it was the following year after a study committee. Yeah. 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 It's a good time for me to tell you and the committee that I told you where you had your head We were walking down the hall and the senator Sears saw me from behind and he oh. up to me and he thought that I was Rick is much better looking from behind than I am. From behind it. Well, SW gets in his head. Yeah. <laughs> All right. Uh, we obviously aren't going to get to S yeah. 8460 this morning. Okay. Yeah. So anybody that's here for sealing, sealing of criminal records and expungement, um, sorry about our aggressive agenda. Thank you. Um, go ahead, Rick. So, good morning, committee. Thank you. For the record, Rick Gauthier, Executive Director of the Vermont Criminal Justice Training Council. Um, I've had a chance to review this bill as it passed the House, and I've talked to David Scherer and talked to council leadership, um, and there's no objection to the contents of the bill as it passed the House. Uh, I heard about the proposed HRC amendment this morning. I haven't actually seen the language, um, so I'm going to obviously withhold any comments until I I've actually yeah. seen. No, um, so you're supporting H518 as it came out of the yes. House. 
Can I ask, um, you have a report here from April 1 of 2018 to March 31st of 2019, um, report to the Senate and House Committees on Judiciary. It's in folders. Yeah, no, I, I've seen I people's folders. Yeah, it looks like this. Um, yeah. Did you want to comment briefly on this report? Well, there's, I, I think it's Act 54 that requires that I make an annual report to the committees and to the legislature on the number of officers who have taken the baseline fair and impartial policing. And the time period is generally April 1 through March 31 because the report is due on before April 1st. Um, I generally run a little late with the report because the training records, uh, training may have taken place in March and I may not get a, a record of it until mid-April. So I generally hold off until I've got all the records. Um, the thing to note with this is that not only is this the number of officers who took it in the preceding year, but uh, as I include in the narrative, this brings us up to less than 30 officers in the state who have had the baseline uh, council approved FIP. And those 30 are generally working on some sort of waiver. They weren't able to do it last year for one reason or another. Okay. So you've given us the names of every police officer, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, that, that Pat, nobody failed it. <coughs> I wish my record had been the other side. <laughs> uh, so, what okay. challenges are you facing in implementing as a, at the Criminal Justice Training Council, implementing fair and impartial policing? Uh, well, a a as you know, um, a couple of years ago, the legislator, legislature made this a mandated training for all law enforcement every odd number of year. Uh, like we have domestic violence, it's mandated every even number of year. So the challenge becomes having somebody not only work on curriculum and meet with the Fair and Impartial Police Subcommittee, but implement the training around the state, track the training. Um, the officers taking the training have to be reported so that we can make an accurate report at the end of the year. Uh, and, and in general, the anytime there's a specific training like that, um, it requires a lot of attention on the part of the training coordinator uh, for a number of reasons. Obviously, curriculum development being huge, but also uh, liaison activities with um, community groups that are interested in the topic. We ran into, oh, back up a little bit. Because I didn't have this specific resource, in the run-up to completing the baseline fit for everybody, we, we struggled bad. Uh, we managed to get it done, um, but it was, it was a struggle. The, other half of that struggle was now we're in 2019. There's a mandated FIP training. Um, we've already developed, working with the FIP committee, we've developed the training, and part of the training is training to the model policy. Um, but the, I would rather see more substantive trainings moving past 2019, moving into 21, 23, and onward. Um, I'd rather see trainings that are much more reflective of what we hear from law enforcement, what their needs are, and what we hear from communities about what they would like to see in law enforcement training. Uh, that, that remains a challenge. Training to the policy um, was very challenging. Um, I articulated to ACLU and Margaret Justice a couple of times what the challenges were, um, but the so uh, in an attempt to kind of resolve some of that, we now roll the model policy training into the level three, I can't say full-time, or Senator White yells at me, into the level three training and into the level two training. It's now mandated training to the policy. And since we've made that a mandated training for all law enforcement this year, it's gonna be primarily online, but I'm actually planning on delivering some of it in the classroom myself. The first session is to constables in a couple weeks when they have their meeting. So, um, but that's really kind of, that's not the, at the level where we want this. You look at domestic violence, for example, it's a very robust, very involved. Um, we're just not there with fair and impartial policing. Uh, and we need to be there. 
The um, so those those that's kind of a thumbnail sketch of some of the challenges we face with that. But are I, because the the department that people represent here aren't listed are members of the Department of Motor Vehicles enforcement team are they required and do uh, officers of fish and wildlife are they required everybody yeah. everybody who's certified so by the council certified. regardless of the agency affiliation if they're certified by the council they have to have this training what about the commissioners if they're certified by law enforcement officers they but have if they're a commissioner of fish and wildlife or commissioner in department of motor vehicles they don't need to I mean, it's, it's not, not mandatory. The irony here, if they're allowed to provide information, what we heard testimony just before you got here, I mean, you got in the chair, you heard the testimony, <coughs> that Enrique was um, reported by, to ICE by the Department of Motor Vehicles, which should never have happened. Um, one, one should, we, should the commission? Should the commissioners of the various agencies be involved here in understanding what the policies are? I can't speak for every agency. I've talked with the commissioners of EPS and Fish and Wildlife. We talked specifically about the model policy. Um, I didn't. I haven't talked to the commissioner in the MP. I understand that's still. A little bit up in the air. Well, no, she, the one has been a, she's been she's been right. Um Can we put into the bill some requirement? Any oh. agency head who's not certified law enforcement officer should. I noticed Chad Smith, for example, who's head of the sheriff's department in Bennington, was on the list, and so I obviously recognize Chad's name. Um, but any anyone who's not a certified law enforcement officer who is um, in charge of certified law enforcement officers should also be required to at least understand the policy. Can, can I comment on, not on that, because... Do you, do you, would you object to that? No, I, I don't care one way or the other. I mean, you're talking about OPR, DMV, Fish and Wildlife, Secretary of State. Um, yeah. That's, it's a, I, I don't care one way or the other, but can I... Yeah, now you can. <laughs> Thank you. So I understand the, the difference between that we've required training to the policy. And I, I understand <clears throat> the, the need to go beyond that because it, in my mind, it's a little bit, I mean, we need to make sure people understand the policy. But we also need to make sure that they understand the context of the policy and why we're doing it. In my mind, it's a little bit like uh, teaching to the test. And if you can, you can teach to the test, but you don't. But students still don't have a broader grasp of why they're being tested on something. And so I wonder how we how we broaden that so that. I mean, it would be like us um, being trained or taught around a specific law that we do instead of having implicit bias training. I mean, it's, we need to broaden the training and instead of just teaching to the test. Does that make any sense at all? Yeah. And I well, wonder how we, yeah. how we do that now that most people have been uh, had some training around the, the policy itself, how do we broaden that training so that we're really um, really educating people instead of training them? And, and I agree 100 percent. This is part of the missed opportunity that I've referenced. Mm -hmm. um, that sort of comprehension and in-depth uh, look at a policy like this really requires classroom training. Yeah. And we didn't have the resources to do that. Yeah. We, just, we just didn't, and yet the requirement was out there that there be training to the policy. Right. So we were caught really doing a rock and a hard place. Here we have a mandate. Here we have no ability to carry out the mandate. So what do we do to try to yeah. to try to comply and at least get some understanding out there? Um, I know that um, 
the, um, the policy issues themselves, this is actually the first time I've heard any, any kind of numbers attached to it. Um, I heard testimony in front of your House counterparts early in the session. Uh, and afterwards, I went out and canvassed the agencies, again, probably the fourth or fifth time, um, to inform them that I had heard, hadn't seen any evidence, but had heard that agencies were not in compliance. Double check your policy. The most up to date policy is on our website. I gave the link to the website. And I heard from a handful of agencies that went and did that, honestly thought they were in compliance, realized they weren't, and promptly went into compliance. The uh, policies you're referencing here, I think you make a good point about some agencies cover it in other policies. I've not seen the policies. I don't know which agencies are affected. I think that there's an opportunity to get those agencies into compliance, and I think that can be done really quickly. Um, well, it should be one policy. <laughs> well, once once the legislature decided to build that flexibility in, this was kind of almost an inevitable outcome. Yeah. Oh, um, I disagree with you, but what? I disagree with you. About what? I think that if, if an agency meets the, the floor, the minimum requirements of the policy and they address all the issues in the policy, <clears throat> that... You, um, you misunderstood. I, di I didn't mean that. I meant there should be one policy in one place, not all over the place. So if you've got a policy over here in your policy manual, what I'm hearing, and maybe I'm misunderstanding, is, and I didn't, somehow Peggy got the, that, that yeah. you kept it. No, I gave um, it Peggy. So some of those cities yes. or towns which are not in compliance say they have the policy somewhere else. That's what I was referring to. Okay, so here's here's the example of that. Our our sheriffs. Well, that's okay. Okay. But, but I'm just saying your if, sheriff should put everything all in one place. So no. if somebody goes and says, "What's your model policy?" We should be able to get it. But here here's the in the model policy. There's a thing that talks about community relations. But our sheriff's office has a a, pol a general policy around community relations. They have a policy book and they have a general policy around community relations. So does that also need to be in the fair and impartial well, I policy? Hurt to repeat it. I can okay. tell you what we did. I mean, this is a problem. I, I'm I know. serious. I, I don't mind them going above. I'm just saying if, if somebody wanted to survey, whether it's Will or, you know, the group against okay. something, wanted to survey and find out if people are meeting the minimum requirements, they should be able to do that without being told, well, the policy's over here somewhere else. I, I can tell you what I did in Bennington when I was writing policy there, and I had a section, uh, use of force, for example, or evidence control, or a number of things. If it was covered somewhere else in policy, and I had a section in the policy I was writing, I would reference in yeah. that policy the other piece, uh, and just bring in a little bit of language, but that would satisfy me. I'm just saying you should be able to find out. Well, it would trigger anybody looking at that right. policy that maybe they need to make another one as we well. We do that in our right. laws. Yeah. So I'm just that's all I was saying. I wasn't trying to say the Wyndham County Sheriff's Department. Can't go no, up. I was just I was just referring to the but, way their policies are written. Well, they cross reference, reference or you know, have a link, right? Have a link, that just like when you read Senator Baruch's books, he has a footnote to tell you where to go to <laughs> exactly. read the full quote. <laughs> he doesn't leave you out there saying, "Well, you should have gone to book X to find out what he all also no. said." <clears throat> I wasn't very clear about it, but I'm not going to pursue it. But what I also okay. told agencies in. January, I believe it was, or February, when I first heard this, was that Act 56 kind of changed the landscape on this. This is now no longer, I didn't abide by statute. This is now either Category B or Category C. Yes. Professional misconduct. So there's an enforcement mechanism built in there. And I reminded them that the goal, the goal, as I saw it at that time, was not to penalize agencies or work. Legitimately thinking they were in compliance, but actually weren't. I, we're running out of time. I, I appreciate you coming and hope you can be here. Hopefully it's next Wednesday, but we got to check and see if we can get a room. we got room for 11. So Peggy's really good at that. So we'll be in room at 11 next Wednesday at 1030. And hopefully you can be available. I don't envy your job on this, and I apologize for the... <laughs>
<laughs> recognizing <laughs> you and, uh, and Joe as the same person. We'll get into a debate about who looks better from the front. We'll do that. Well, I'm not worried about the front. It's from the back that you look to like. <laughs> I can see Rick has a different <laughs> color <laughs> sport coat on. You've got to be coming to this one, Sam. What? I think. Oh, you think your committee has me coming up next Wednesday anyway? We do. Mm -hmm. Well, well Lucia, thank, thank you, Rick. Thank, thank, you. Rick. thank, thank you all very Thanks. much. I'm sorry about the room size, and uh, we didn't gonna get to you, and I'm sorry. That, uh, what did you want? Could I just have five minutes, please? Uh, I have to go. We've got committee members. Yeah. I had told oh. maybe don't schedule, yeah. and somebody yeah. said schedule. Yeah. Can you come back next week? No, I'm in the Supreme Court next month. All right, well, if we're okay. committee members who can stay. I can stay. Go ahead. Yeah. Yeah. Stay go ahead. Yeah. All right. Oh, well, I, I told you You're so. You're right. You were right, Senator Sears. Absolutely. Thank you very much. I, I will endeavor to be super fast. Uh, okay. Leah Ernst, staff attorney at the ACLU of Vermont. Um, we've been saying for a long time that. One, the model policy is insufficiently strong and contains loopholes and unnecessary concessions to federal overreach. And two, even the policy as it exists uh, hasn't been effectively implemented. And, and I won't rehash the ground that, that others have, have today. Um, this bill does uh, not address some of the fundamental concerns we have, but it does move the ball. Um, we do support this bill. We work together very well with the other folks you've heard from today in um, drafting that language and we encourage uh, this bill to go forward. It's really quite simple what this bill does. It just makes explicit what we thought the other bill did do. It establishes a baseline below which individual agencies <coughs> cannot fall, but agencies may choose to go above. Uh, we'll continue advocating for that baseline to rise, but in the meantime, this bill says for those agencies that want to make a decision to have greater protections, it's very clear that they may do so. And to get to Senator Sears' question about trust, um, part of why we support this bill is this bill on its own won't necessarily generate that trust, but it allows agencies uh, clarity and freedom to enact the policies they believe will increase that trust in their own communities. Mm -hmm. um, this bill also gets the state out of the business of having to wade into the federal law thicket um, which I think the Attorney General's Office and the Training Council are, are glad to see. Um, and I think that this is sort of an elegant way of, of dealing with those problems. Um, with respect to the question about different systems of justice, if agencies do adopt different policies, um, of course our preference would be that they're all the same and they all are at this much higher baseline that we're going to advocate for, but in the meantime, um, this is a compromise um, solution and, and we do support it. And we already do have different enforcement practices um, in different agencies and counties, state's attorney's offices and law enforcement agencies around the, around the state as well. It's something we're already familiar with. Um, these, the concerns about funding in 1373, we know this administration has been, has adopted, uh, as David said, a maximalist position, um, as Kevin Scott said, a, a unpredictable position, and I don't believe that we can um, look at what is the worst case scenario, of what unreasonable argument the federal government might make, and then fall short of, of that, you know, I, I think we need to decide as a state what is the best policy for us, what best re reflects Vermont's values, what best protects our, our communities, and take that stand. Um, this administration has, has put forth unreasonable and untenable legal positions um, and been thwarted at every turn by the federal court, specifically with respect to 1373. So I don't think... Um, a, a speculative risk that it will change its position on subgrantees, for example, um, uh, should allow us to, to not stand up for the things that we believe in as a state. Um, I will leave the HRC stuff, that's great. Um, and I will, I will leave it there. I'm happy to if take any other, questions. Well, if you have other comments, we'll be happy to take them in writing or if you yeah, go back at another day. I don't intend to finish the bill next Wednesday, so there will be 
time for the committee to continue to work on it. We have an amendment from the Human Rights Commission that we'll consider uh, next week. So um, you may want to weigh in on that as well. Yeah, and I, I will see if someone else from my office might be able to be here, although I suspect they might want to be in the audience at the court. <coughs> Oh, what are you doing? Thank you. Uh, this is Doyle versus uh, Burlington Police Department. It's a public records case. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you.